Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> hello. We're here. Volume six. <laughs> I'm a uh, uh, fun fact just before stream, like literally one minute ago, if even, my dogs went into full banana mode. <laughs> like zoomies extreme. <laughs> They running up and down the stairs, zipping around, uh, around the bed, like, like, like doing WWE tricks and, and everything. <laughs> and I'm like, please, <laughs> please, I don't want to stop you because, like, you're playing and I don't want to make you, like, feel like you're not allowed to play. But also, please, <laughs> like, quietly. <laughs> Uh, but they they stopped. They got it out of their system, like, just in time. <laughs> Hello! It's, it's, it's volume six. A nice, a nice chill. I'm ready to have just, like, a nice chill time. Uh, you missed it. I, when I opened up this, uh, window to, like, get stream going, I had missed this ad, and I'm sure we'll watch it again. It was four, it was technically four ads, but what it really was, was eight two different ones that counted as one longer ad and they were exactly the same and they were all razor related like razors like Gillette or something so I think we're gonna I think we're gonna have a, a big stint of razor related ads today <laughs> rather than our usual tide <laughs> all right so what introduced me to Ruby I just happened to what uh, to subscribe to Rooster Teeth the exact day uh, the Red trailer came out. Because I was already watching their content, like their Let's Plays and skits and whatever. Um, and I was like, you know what, yeah. And I was back when they were all one channel. Eventually they split into multiple sub-channels, like Achievement Hunter and Rooster Teeth and Rooster Teeth Animation. But initially they were all in the one. And I subscribed to them magically on the day the red trailer came out. Like it was like a couple of hours later the red trailer like came and it blew me away. And it was the most magical thing I had ever seen. <laughs> um yeah, volume six brought to you by razors. <laughs> uh let's just get going with volume six. I'm ready for a nice chill day of watching a the one of the good volumes. One of the better volumes with Ruby. <laughs> I don't have any fun beverages to drink today, but it is important to still stay hydrated. I usually have like a Powerade or something. Uh, I didn't have time today, so I just have a really, really big cup of water. And I'm really hoping I won't accidentally <laughs> smack it and spill all of my water all over all of my things. <laughs> I like stopped having open cups near my desk like years ago because I, I wasn't like I don't spill often but when I do it's always catastrophic you know <laughs> so I tend to just stick to like like lidded beverages for now do you remember those like ads old like as seen on tv type stuff where it's like get a lid for your cup and I'm like cups aren't universally sized though so that wouldn't even work <laughs> Yeah, I lost my spot. Tide didn't agree with my spicy hot takes about volume five, apparently. <laughs> yeah, volume six. I like volume six. I think it is one of the better within the top three volumes of Ruby. And I was thinking about it. This was like the first time I didn't necessarily have the same opinion as everyone else. Because everyone can kind of generally agree on volumes one through five, right? Like, we all generally agree, like, volume one's good, but has uh, some obvious hiccups. Volume two starts really good, but the ending's kind of meh. Volume three is generally considered really great. Volume four is okay, volume five is terrible. But volume six was the first time people really started having, like, vastly different opinions. Hi, Kaiser. Hey, Critter. Hope you have a good time. I'm planning on it. We're just vibing today. We're just being chill and cool. Just gonna vibe and... and I'm gonna try to make sure I talk while watching the Apathy episodes and not just go quiet and watch Ruby <laughs> on my own. <laughs> I just really like the Apathy episodes. They're too good. 
Um, yeah, but Volume 6 came out, and it's, I think it was the first one that people were really polarized on, you know? Uh, well, I'm glad you're here for however long you end up staying, Kaiser. <laughs> you know, the volume was really polarizing, and I think a part of it was, it's a combination of three things, I think. One, uh, some people thought it was just fine all the way through, and were actually happy that the Adam stuff ended up happening in the end. Uh, then there was another section of people who were really unhappy with how the Adam stuff played out. And then there was another section of people who I think were just kind of disillusioned from Volume 5 in general. You know? Like, after Volume 5, I think the magic kind of kind of left us. You know? After we saw how actually lazy the production could really be, I think we all kind of... Kind of, that was when the, like, the, the twinkle in our eye went away in, in regards to Ruby. We started to, to see it more for the, the company product it is rather than just, oh, that, that amazing, like, passion project made by a ragtag, scrappy team of, of indie animations and whatever. I think we all kind of, like, realized, like, how good and how bad the quality of the show could be. And I think volume six, a lo- volume six, a lot of people didn't even watch it. Volume five was the end for a lot of people. And uh, and I'll be honest, this first episode, horrible. Ruby, as a show, is cursed with horrible first episodes. The first episode of, I think, every single volume is absolute dog turds. <laughs> Oh, the statue scene! Azure Moon! Why would you remind me? I had buried that in the recesses of my memories, completely exiling it from my mind. <laughs> Ugh, I think I've gotten over it. I think I've said everything I can say. Watch, we'll get to the, yeah, the statue scene and I'll, I'll be revved up into a whole new rant. <laughs> Yeah, the first episode's bad. The comedy's always terrible. The animation's usually not that impressive. You know, which is fine. I don't know. It's just a lot of weird things. This one's weird because the whole, like, Ruby having a gift, a secret little gift thing for Yang is weird. It's not funny. It's a weird little plot point they insist upon. (laughs) Like, it's fine. It's just not... It's one of those things where, like, it exists solely for the sake of a punchline and not even, like, a good punchline. <laughs> it's like it's like with Volume 9, with them trying to get Gamble Shroud out of the vines. Like, and Weiss being like, I'm low on dust. It's just, like, it's not a real... Th- it's just a thing that exists for the sake of something that they consider to be a punchline or a joke for this scenario. Because, like, we never see what Ruby gets Yang. They say in the commentary that it's the magazine she's reading later. It just... It feels like a moment that has a lot of, like, emphasis on it for not really being a thing. <laughs> um, oh, here it is. It's gonna be the same thing. Two whole minutes. Two entire minutes two aggravatingly long minutes of the same ad eight times because only half of it was the female one and then the other half is the male one and so it's gonna be the same thing every time (laughs) um what was i just saying about what was i saying Uh, the gillette infuriated me too much (laughs) Oh, here's a little thing I wanted to say. Um, it's 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 windy today. It is real windy. There's a storm threatening to arrive. So if um if like stream buffers or cuts out, it's not you. It's definitely probably me because the storm is happening. I really it doesn't seem like it's gonna thunder or anything, but there is a big fear in me <laughs> that. One of these days I'll be streaming and then the power will suddenly go out and it will be a horrifyingly scary experience for everyone. (laughs) Thank you, JK Network. What about Volume 2, Episode 1 with the food fight? Oh, you know what? That one is pretty good, actually. And Emerald and Mercury's introduction is really good, too. Food fight's a lot of fun. A really cute, smart, funny way to reintroduce everyone's weapons. 
Yeah, I think you're right. Volume two, that's the best first episode. Even volume one's first episode, it's fine. Like, the, the stuff with Torchwick is good. But, I don't know. It's it's slow. It's a little claggy, <laughs> I guess, is the best way I could put it. Volume two, I think you nailed it. Uh, thank you, George, as well. Hey, Critter, I hope you're having a good day and are ready to dive into volume six. I'm glad I could catch the stream on my birthday. It's your birthday? Happy birthday, George! <laughs> Yay! Congratulations! Birth... <laughs> Birth arrived! <laughs> Hooray! Everyone tell George happy birthday. Yay! <laughs> I hope you get cake. It'll be my birthday soon, too. Uh, I, I want to get a cake. I'm not... I'm, maybe I'll get ice cream cake. I've never had an ice cream cake for myself. Like, I've had it. I've eaten it. I've been to birthday parties. But I never got one for myself. Maybe I'll do that this year. We'll see. What flavor should I get? And also suggest flavors for George, too. George is, uh, is more, like, imminently important. <laughs> um, uh, there was a thing I wanted to- Oh yeah, someone had a comment today that Ilya had silver eyes, and I wanted to double check, and I knew we were gonna be watching this, like, episode, and I was like, this is the most, like, neutral lighting we can see her eye color in. Uh, they're definitely purple. <laughs> Looking at it, they look- they're close to silver. It is frustrating how many characters have eyes that are close to silver. Like, Mercury's is gray. Coco's eyes look really silver for a while there. It's just hard because lots of times when there's, like, colored lighting in a scene. Like, when we meet Team Coffee, it's all sunset, so everything's, like, tinted orange. I remember there was a thing floating around way back in the day, in volume two, when it was airing. Um, people were talking about like, like specific colors for eyes and things. And someone like took the picture of, oh, a Twilight's here too. Everyone, all of Team Jack are just showing up. <laughs> Critter, you're a big adult, get an ice cream cake. I got a chocolate one because I always got vanilla before. Yeah. That, Yes, <laughs> I should get some. I don't want it to be whole chocolate because too much chocolate's overwhelming, right? You know, vanilla's nice, but I don't think vanilla would be nice as an ice cream cake, right? Like vanilla ice cream isn't good, but vanilla cake is fine. Hmm. Hmm. The thing that always gets me is I'm just so like charmed by strawberry in general, but strawberry flavor is pretty hit or miss sometimes with sweets. Sometimes it's too bitter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, oh yeah, it was a thing with Coco. They were trying to figure out like what color her eyes are. And they took the picture, like a screenshot from the volume two finale. And then they opened, they had like the, um, like the color triangle that you see in like, um, like, like art programs. And they're like, and then we just, we take the color that it is. And then we just move it to see the color that it's supposed to be. And I'm like, that's not how that- you can't just move it anywhere you want on the triangle to negate the color effect of the sunset. <laughs> like, I understood what they were trying to do, they just didn't quite get it, you know? <laughs> um, I was gonna say something- yeah, there was a thing I was thinking about. Oh, I should start with this. This one's kind of important. I've updated my Patreon, so now I have a Discord. I have a Discord server. It's, um, chill. Not many people are, are active right now, <laughs> which is fine. We're very chill and cool. Um, but yeah, for everyone who is sitting there clamoring about, about me having a Discord server, I have one now. It's there. Uh, you need to be a $2 patron, at least, to uh, be invited. I have it now. <laughs> I am trying to not be an old lady and I'm trying to like understand how technology do. <laughs> so yeah, I have a- and I also have two new patron levels. They're just higher like like monetary values in case you want something a little bit extra to like help me out a little bit extra. You know, um, I just- I've just shaken things up. I figured while I was doing the discord thing, <laughs> throw those options in there while I- while I was there, you know? <laughs> Um, I would join if I wasn't broke. Totally understand. <laughs> That's the thing. I never, I never blame someone if they're like, I have no money. And I'm like, I get it. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah, yeah our, our Discord servers fuse together, me and twins. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 
Um, I was gonna, so I was, I've been thinking about, since nothing's happening so far in this episode, I was thinking about volume 10, potentially down the line. Because I, I made that video um, where I, I spliced together the first line every character says and the last line every character says. I got more wrongs than I expected. And it's not the ones I thought I would get. Like, I've heard, I got a Ty's line completely wrong. I totally forgot he talked to Summer at the end of Volume 9. Um, even though I scrubbed through the scene to, like, double-check Summer's lines. And I was wrong when Summer's first line. It's because I haven't seen Volume 9 too many times, you know? <laughs> I don't remember necessarily all the little things. <laughs> but I totally got Ty's last line wrong. And I got uh, Ozpin's last line wrong as well. But well, that's fine. I was planning on having things be wrong anyway, because when the volume 9 end credits special new end credits sequence comes out, uh, I, I'm, if it's like the teaser animatic we saw, then there'll be quite a few new last lines for characters. Like Crow and Willow specifically is what I think about. Um, but... So yeah, I was like, I'll have to make an updated version anyway. So I'll just, but I wanted to like get that video out there so I could see just how like wrong I was. Cause I knew I was going to get things wrong because I am human. <laughs> but I was like, I'll get the video out there so that people can like explicitly tell me how I'm wrong so I can fix it. I also totally forgot to include Sienna, which disappointed me. Uh, I almost forgot about talk, but I remembered her like right at the last second while I was going through. Um, I, 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 purposefully forgot forest <laughs> like i didn't forget i just like oh mm, i'll include I'm, I'm planning on making an updated version uh later you know uh once we see the end credit sequence and whatever and i'll fix things i'll include forest and sienna and i'll fix all the ones i i got wrong so that'll be fun um there's this uh, there's a ruby mandela effect floating around apparently you know like, okay, so I I thought for sure Clover says something after, you know, he after he gets stabbed, Crow runs up to him and Clover says his thing. And then Crow's like, I'll make sure James pays for it and the sun starts to rise. And I thought for sure he had said something after the sun started to rise. And I got two different comments and they were both the same where they thought the same thing and they specifically thought Clover said... Um, uh, good luck with that. Or something like, something on the lines of good luck. And then he dies. And we all thought he said something and he did it. I even, like, was so, like, like, they both were so sure. And I had the idea. I went back and double, double checked to make sure that there wasn't an extra line that I had missed. And that's fun to me. <laughs> that's fun that there's a Ruby Mandela effect about Clover's last line. Um, Forrest was the guy who introduced the idea of the Happy Huntresses. He died very quickly. He, uh, 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 Tyrion killed him the same episode he was introduced, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Thank you, JK Network, with another one! Wow! In regards to both Ruby and Hasbin, I've seen many people defend Adam's actions and saying he was right in killing sinners. It reminded me of the times Ironwood was defended, fans saying he was right and heroes wrong. Thoughts? Interesting. I think... The thing is, with, with Hasbin Hotel Adam, uh, the notion of killing sinners was a show of force. So I don't think he needed to. Um, but I don't like blame the concept because of, for the sake of the story, you know? Uh, uh, like it makes, like they do a fine enough job of making it make sense in universe. So, but I don't see many, I like, I do agree that the more ethical solution is Charlie's solution of let's not have everyone being killed en mass every year. Um, with Ironwood, I can understand, like, he wasn't, Ironwood was trying to save people. You know, he was trying to save as many people as he could. He wanted to get everybody onto Atlas and then float them to safety, hoping Salem wouldn't be able to reach them in the upper atmosphere. Uh, so I think Ironwood, a lot of people, like, like, and, and then in Volume 8, they, like, ruin his characterization to make him, like, a goofy cartoon villain because they are bad at writing characters and they, real, they, they realized they had goofed up and made Ironwood too understanding and sympathetic. 
I don't I like I think I think it's easy to root for Ironwood specifically through volume 7 when you listen to his like meanings and his like perspective on things it's harder to root for Adam from Hasman Hotel because like there are it's a less simplistic trolley problem with Ironwood there there's a lot of variations and extra factors in his situation like Salem's forces, what her powers are, the relics in general, he has one, she has one, you know, there's a lot of extra things involved with Ironwood, and Ironwood's uh, attempt isn't necessarily, like, he's trying to do something for the good of others, whether he's succeeding is questionable, but Adam in Hasman Hotel is specifically, like, it's less black and white. They're doing this specifically as a show of power. It's not for anything more grand than that, you know? And so it's easier to not root for him in that scenario. Does that make sense? <laughs> does that, like, does, did I explain myself good? <laughs> Critter, hello, I'm late, but I, but nice to see you. Question, is this the volume where the heroes started to be villains to you? Good question, Caleb. Not really. This wasn't it. It really started with volume 7 and then, like, really, really hit home with volume 8. Like, they make some dumb, questionable decisions in this volume. Specifically, like, stealing the airship, you know? But... Like, I can understand the, the the point the writers were trying to go with was giving them things to, to like, work around. Like, oh, we can't have the turrets on because we need some kind of little conflict for this episode. So they had to make the, the gimmick of the turrets are a problem somehow. They just do a bad job. And it's the same thing with Steel the Airship. They just do a bad job actually setting up those concepts. You know, like, how, if the turrets were actually being a problem, that'd be fine. But it doesn't really look that way. And similarly with, like, stealing an airship later. Like, if they had just exhausted any other options, it would have worked out better. So I see what they were trying to go for. They're just bad at setting themselves up, which is weird. <laughs> so much of the show is sitting around talking about things. You'd think there'd be plenty of time to set up their actual plot points. <laughs> Uh, with volumes 7 and 8, the problem was, like, Ironwood was so reasonable. Like, it's a trolley problem. There's no right or wrong answer. And I was intrigued by the concept of Team Ruby, like, having these convictions one way, but no one's really wrong, you know? The only wrong one is Salem, because her goal is destruction incarnate. Ironwood's not trying to, like, get people killed. He's trying to do what he can. Like, what is it, the pragmatic point of view versus the the hopeful point of view? You know, he's being a bit more realistic in this situation where Team Ruby is like, like the hope kind of idea. Like, oh, we can save everyone if we try, which it makes sense for a type, like a shonen anime kind of thing like that. That's a very, like, anime hero is the hopeful one that wants to do more than what is realistically possible. That's understandable. The problem was... How they didn't do a good job actually making Ironwood seem like he was being unreasonable. The characters kept insisting upon it and villainizing him over it, but his actions weren't even that far-fetched. And then in Volume 8, they really just... Throw, yeah, dogmatic versus pragmatic. Pragmatic. You're, you're right, Seabass. Like, and then in Volume 8, they kind of just threw it all out the window to be like, Look, Team Ruby are the goodest guys ever, and Ironwood is big bad. So, <laughs> that's, it was really volume 8. Volume 8 is horrible. <laughs> I hate volume 8. It isn't as bad as volume 5, but man, volume 8 did a number. And I was going to say something. So I, about, so, I was thinking about volume 10. About the potential of volume 10 maybe happening down the line. And I was thinking about it while I was doing the dishes today. The idea of making volume 10 is probably going to be really expensive. If whoever ends up doing it, if it's Rooster Teeth can make it happen, or if some other company picks it up. Thank you, Sonic Falcon. Thank you. Do you think there's disconnect between being in the company side watching the show versus watching as a viewer? Like how Bernie and company talk about it? I think so. 
I think so. I think that happens with a lot of things. Because as a viewer, I can just, like, see it for what it is. When you're in the company, you are you sit through the process of, like, explaining everything, and then your, your plans change, and you have updates to your systems and things like that, and you watch as, like, oh, this was going to be this way, but then we had to change it to be this other way. And in that process, it's easy to forget that the audience hasn't been shown or told explicit things about the story. Like, for example, like with the steal the airship thing. Like, they may have sat there and, like, talked with each other in the writing room about what they could do to get to the steal the airship plot point. But, you know, that dialogue might have gotten cut from the actual uh, show itself. And it's easy to forget that the audience isn't privy to that information, you know? So, I think, yeah, when you're working on a product, it's a lot different versus the viewer's experience looking at it. Because also when you're working on it, you understand, like, what limitations had to be made. Like, I could sit here and say, they should have had a scene where they talk about X, Y, Z. But in the, uh, like, the, the production side, they might sit there and be like, well, we were going to have that, but we had to cut it for reasons, reasons, reasons. They know all those reasons. We don't get to know those reasons. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, like, the production side is always going to have more insight into concepts than what the viewer has. But it's easy. But the thing is, the viewer's not wrong. You can just, they just have a different understanding on it. Does that make sense? Uh, thank you again, JK Network. You think it would have been better if Ruby explained that they don't trust Ironwood because of Leo, because he was an adult that acted nice but betrayed them. Would that have been better? Uh, I think that would have been way better. I feel like they were trying to set that up, but they didn't, like, lean into it more, you know? And it makes so much sense, because, like, they trusted Leo, and then he backstabbed them. They also trusted Ozpin, and he hid secrets. It, like, the, the idea of the kids not trusting the people who are supposed to be the ones in power makes a lot of sense, but they don't actually address those ideas. Which is one of Ruby's problems, is they have the groundwork for everything to actually work out perfectly. Everything should actually, theoretically, make perfect sense. But the problem is the characters never actually talk about the actions that they've had experienced prior in the show. Like, all that setup that should be doing a great job being the foundation for future plot lines doesn't end up working because the characters never actually address it. They're always so busy addressing whatever current thing they're, they're bumbling through, you know? Like, they're too busy talking about, oh, Jacques sneeze party! Oh, we're worried about Jacques Snee bringing the election with his party! And it's like, no, be talking about your trust... With Ironwood and Leo and things. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's so weird. A part of me is like, they should talk more. But a lot of the show is already them talking. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe they just prioritize the wrong things when talking. And then, also, thank you so much, Wild Pilot. Uh, sorry if you discussed this earlier, but I can't recall. What are your thoughts on Dylan Goo? People dislike him mostly for his relationship with Shane, but I don't think you share their distaste for him. I don't. I like Dylan. I think his animation's amazing. He seems like a very nice guy. I followed a lot of his tutorials when I was figuring out how to animate on my own, and he has a lot of very easy-to-follow tutorials. Um, so that's really cool. I think he harbors no ill will. You know, like, like the thing with him and Shane is people will, like, vilify their them conceptually because they aren't aligned with Rooster Teeth anymore. And it's mostly just because those people are Rooster Teeth bootlickers. They just sit there l lapping up the taste of Rooster Teeth heel because they're so obsessed with the concept of the company that they vilify people who don't align with it. Even though, like, a lot of them don't work at Rooster Teeth anymore. Even though they're still working on Rooster Teeth productions. Like, Kara doesn't work there, the voice actress for Weiss. Miles doesn't work there, he's a freelancer now. The voice of Jean and one of the writers, you know? <laughs> so, I think the people who are all up in arms about Dylan are just basically trying to find a villain to blame who isn't the company. Because it's 100% the company's problem. It's the company's fault that they have no money. And 
but the the crazy Ruby fanatics don't want to admit that. So they, they look for someone else to, to be to be the bad guy in their scenario so they can continue to ignore reality. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think it would be fine if Dylan picked it up because especially with like the concept of animation, Ruby's animation is weird and different and not a lot of people I think would be able to mimic this kind of style. Um, but I think Dylan has a good, not only because Dylan worked at First Teeth, so he does understand what Ruby's doing style wise, but also just looking at his other animations on his channel, he, he seems to like grasp the 3D realm that Ruby is playing with to like a very good degree. So I think like animation wise, that'd be like fine. A lot of people are really up in arms about like, oh, but the writing process. He's never claimed he would like be a writer or anything. He just claimed he would buy it if he could <laughs> to like keep making the show, you know? Like, like he would probably hire writers. <laughs> I, I, yeah, people who are upset about Dylan Goo, I think are just desperate to be upset at someone other than Rooster Teeth because it's hard because they don't want to blame Daddy Rooster Teeth for losing all their money <laughs> and getting the company shut down. So they blame other people. That's what I think. Um, so, volume 10, potentially down the line. I think I burned my tongue. <laughs> I had lunch just before. I made ramen and I think I burned my tongue. Hmm. Everything's gonna taste weird. <laughs> so, so it was volume 10 down the line. I was thinking about it. It's, people expect new outfits for Team Ruby. And for Team Juniper. And lots of characters in general. And every new design, every new model, is going to be extra money that they have to spend. That, that's, that's more money to pay for the design, the designer, to design the outfits. And then the modelers, and then the, like, rig team. The team who, like, makes the bones inside the skeletons. I know there are ways to cheat that process or to make it easier. Um, but still, every single one, you can only cheat so much. Like, you can copy, like, head shapes, face shapes. Once you get a skeleton for one character, you can, like, copy that skeleton for most all characters. Unless they're vastly different sizes. Like, Maria probably has her own specific skeleton. But, that, and that's not even, like, including, like, Team Sun or Team Coffee, who are supposedly going to be in Vacuo. And not including any other new characters. Because, like, cause let's say they make new outfits for just Team Ruby. Not even Juniper. You know? That's still four new models they need to make for Team Ruby. And it, it, this is also assuming they could get some of the old models for old characters. We don't know what's going to happen in the animation pipeline. Everything might need to be rebuilt from the ground up. And so, with Volume 10, we're looking at... All of Team Ruby, all of Team Juniper, so that's eight characters. And then Crow, that's a nine characters. Willow and the rest of the Schnee family. And then there's the, uh, the rest of the Aesops. We need Theodore, the, the headmaster of Vacuo, to show up. Then there's Salem and Tyrion and Mercury and Cinder and who knows what other characters. Like, even if they cut out... Team Sun and Team Coffee and any other side characters. Well, the Happy Huntresses, you know, that's a lot of characters. And even if they can get the models and everything from Rooster Teeth, you know, that's still a lot to, like, do on top of the ones that's, like, new characters that they have to completely make from the ground up, right? So, and then they have to make all of Vacuo, too. Like, just making the characters alone is one thing. And then there's also the Grimm that they'll have to fight, inevitably. Uh, so that, that they have to make all of Vacuo. They have to make the desert environment. They, can, they need to make, like, the school, because presumably they're going to be at Haven. <laughs> they, they, at the end of Volume 9, they walked out and there was that big old landscape with all that stuff going on. They have to... That's a lot to make and it can't just be one location that was one of the problems with volume five that people had a lot of issue with was that they just stayed in their one house the entire time because that was easier to animate you know 
it was really easy to just have them be in one location the entire time. But it was also very ugly and boring, and people had a lot of problems with it. So everything for Vacuo, basically every single thing, needs to be built from the ground up. And I was thinking about what a buffoonish idea it was to waste Volume 9's resources on all of the Wonderland stuff. <laughs> like, you know, like, they knew. They knew. <laughs> they knew they were struggling monetarily. Hello, Skywalker. They knew they were struggling with money and they, they with resources. They knew the show was struggling. They knew that was happening. And they still insisted on the weird, maybe filler volume of Wonderland <laughs> and all those resources. They got their, their extra budget from Crunchyroll and everything to help make the whole thing happen. Hello, Asherville. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and they did make all of that happen. They got their special little budget and they made all those locations. There's so many locations in the Ever After. They made the Jabberwalker, the Jinxie, the Red Prince, all these characters, a bunch of characters. There's a bunch of stuff. They made all of that. And they can't reuse any of it for Vacuo. <laughs> you know? Like, like, that's a lot of resources that they could have been building to help them with the next leg of their adventure, which is the Vacuo adventure. And instead, they spent all that time making a bunch of brand new resources, locations, and characters, and rigs, and models, and everything for the weird Wonderland plot that might or might not be coming back. <laughs> it's weird, right? Like they, And they sit there and wonder why they're struggling monetarily. They used all those resources and and spent it all on a volume that just made that's just like i don't even think well, oh, we're not going back to the ever after right why not use that time to like build the resources for the plot proper because even like when people were watching volume nine it was a lot of like but where's our story <laughs> where's where's the maidens what happened to the, all the civilians? Where's Salem? What's where's Crow? Where where's the plot? <laughs> I, it, no matter, it, time has passed. It's been nearly a year since Volume Nine came out. We're, we're quickly approaching the anniversary, and I still, from every perspective, don't understand why they had the whole volume take place in like a weird wonderland setting like being so separated from the plot i don't get it <laughs> did i watch slash listen to the fuckface episode after announcement no i haven't i i've never watched any of that <laughs> i didn't know what it was for a long time i didn't even realize it was like a rooster teeth related product I just, uh, did they announce anything important or good? <laughs> I, I doubt it. <laughs> but yeah, like, I just don't get it. Like, 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 it's, 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 like, I was going through and I was getting all the, um, the first and last lines for that video. And the moment I, like, got to volume nine and started getting the lines for the volume nine characters, I'm like, it's just weird, isn't it? <laughs> Critter, uh, RTX like a person who lives beyond their means and doesn't understand how money works and then they wonder why they have why they're tens of thousands in debt. Yes. It's so weird, especially monetarily, right? <laughs> like, oh, we're struggling with money. We're obviously struggling with money. Let's have a weird filler volume in Wonderland. <laughs> why? Why would why would you waste your time budget resources, a modeling team, animation department? Why would you waste all that on this stuff rather than building up the vacuo resources for the next leg of your supposed adventure? Especially when that's the plot. Like, like, like having, like showing vacuo to us is the thing we're all looking for. Why would you not, like, like that's like make hype for the story having us go i just i just don't get it 
Thank you again, JK Network. There's been many discussions on the world building, but what are your thoughts on the aesthetic of Remnant? Atlas stands out to me, but design-wise for the other kingdoms, I think it's just okay. What about you? That's a- okay. I've thought about this a lot, actually. It's a good question. Theoretically, I really like the idea of Remnant. There's a couple of really neat places. Like, I think of the Forever Fall Forest. That is hands down the coolest thing they ever came up with. You know, like, easily the coolest location they ever had. Uh, even just, like, the normal forest, the Emerald Forest, with, like, weird ruins of, like, past civilizations sprinkled throughout. That's cool. That, like, makes my fantasy brain happy. You know? <laughs> um... I think other things are cool. Like, a theoretically, Atlas is really dope. The flo I, I love me some floating islands. That is my favorite thing. If you if your story has floating islands, I am automatically love it. <laughs> and having it be called Atlas and Mantle is so smart and cool. Cause like, cause do you get it? Because like Atlas, Atlas was the the, the guy who holds the world on his sh sh shoulders. And mantle is what is, like, part of the earth. And so it's, like, backwards. It's, uh, oh, I love it. <laughs> Naming-wise, it's great. <laughs> Theoretically, it is cool. I think it is fun. And I think, but I do think, on the other hand, they don't play around with it enough. Like, a lot of Mistral was really boring in my mind. It was just very, like, samey as each other. I think, the, especially... With locations like the pathways in Mistral that they're walking on, or like the tundra out on the outskirts of um, Atlas and, and Mantle and whatever, I think they miss the opportunity to play around with natural environments more. Specifically, dust. I've mentioned it a couple of times on stream, but I've specifically mentioned like dust in relation to vacuo. Like having a water dust deposit somewhere could be a really cool environmental thing to play with with vacuo. But everyone, all of them, like like dust is so cool, and I think that's why like one of the other definitely coolest locations in Remnant, the like floating islands. Uh, Weiss goes through in the beginning of volume five when she fights the Lancers. That's an awesome location. And the idea is like it's all anti gravity dust that's making them all float. And they just naturally do that. I think that's really, really fun. And I wish they played around with that more throughout like all the environment. Because we see so many things. Yeah, Tide came back. <laughs> the hero we were waiting for. Tide. <laughs> so yeah, I think dust in general is really cool, and I wish they played around the world. It would be a fun way to play with the fantasy of it. In general, I think there are really cool ideas with Remnant, but there's also some things that I think are just a little bit boring. So it's a bit, a bit of a back and forth. Like, if you asked me my favorite fantasy realms, I don't think Remnant would make the list, but... I can't deny that there are good ideas here. They, they do play around with some cool stuff. I just wish they played more. I also think they missed the opportunity to play around with, like, animals a bit. You know, we have the Grimm. But, you know, just, like, what natural animals are in the area, I think, could be a lot of fun as well. Thank you, Godzilla Slayer. Critter loves the story of Fortnite. <laughs> Is it... Are there floating islands in Fortnite? I don't know anything about Fortnite. <laughs> I've never played it. I clip of gameplay and it just looked like a shooty gun game like like like, like there was uh, people with guns and they ran a bit like Apex Legends I think <laughs> but uh and I know all the characters from everything ever is in it <laughs> So, uh, if there's floating islands, yes. I'm, I, I'm, I'm one over. <laughs> I specifically remember it in the game Crystallis. No one's gonna remember Crystallis. Does anyone know Crystallis? Does anyone even know what I am saying? It was a game on the NES. The original NES. The old school NES. It was a game called Crystallis. The box art is dope. It's like this, like, barbarian warrior man fighting, like, an eyeball monster in, like, tall grass with, like, a castle or something. 
dope. <laughs> it was super cool. Uh, the actual game, you play as this little pink-haired man with a little pink outfit, and the, and the opening cutscene, it talked about, like, floating islands. And, like, I like as a child, that just unlocked the fantasy love section of my brain, and the, and the floating islands just stuck with me. I never made it to the floating islands or anything in the game. I didn't know how to beat it. I actually couldn't beat the tutorial. I got lost. <laughs> I, I, I got stuck and I couldn't figure out what I was doing. <laughs> Did it own an NES? Yeah, it's a it's old even for me. <laughs> it was just my, my mother had one. My mother had an NES. My great grandmother had an SNES and she had all the best games on it and she was amazing. Her name was Gigi. I called her Gigi. G G for great grandmother. She was amazing. Uh, <laughs> and she was really good at video games. And whenever I was stuck on a level, Gigi would, would beat the level for me. So yeah, my mother had an NES. Gigi had an SNES. Uh, and then and then we got an N64. And it was all over then. <laughs> and then we all and then we had all of them. <laughs> we had we had GameCube, we had an Xbox. The Xbox wasn't amazing, but we got a GameCube, then we got a PlayStation 2 eventually, and it was just video games for the rest. It's just in my blood same. And my grandmother, because Gigi was my mother's grandmother, my great grandmother, her mother, my grandmother, played PC games. <laughs> so the woman of my family just play video games <laughs> with generations of video <laughs> Thank you again, Godzilla Slayer. Ruby actually wanted to do a Fortnite collab, but they chose Naruto instead. Days of all time, <laughs> of course they went with Naruto. <laughs> Your grandmother was the cat from Kiki's Delivery Service? <laughs> His name is Gigi, isn't it? <laughs> I always forget. <laughs> Is everyone staying hydrated? Is everyone liking, commenting, and subscribing while they're staying hydrated and drinking their water? You better be. <laughs> um, I definitely burned my tongue. That's so annoying. I burned it on cheese, too. I had ramen. I've been making ramen every day. Like, regular maruchan ramen but i found out if you add a slice of american cheese it makes it like a hundred times better so <laughs> that's what i've been doing every day and i'm upset that i've burned my tongue on my cheesy ramen <laughs> because i'm definitely gonna have it again tomorrow <laughs> thank you again jk network your criticism on volume 9 is fair, though, for me. I am glad Ruby went for a more character-focused volume than story-wise, because a big issue with Ruby is, at times, it doesn't focus enough on Team Ruby. But I think it could have done both. Yes, I 100% agree. Like, I can't say volume 9 was totally filler, because what we got was so important. In my mind, though, I'm like, I don't understand why we couldn't have had this super important character-driven stuff and also had it take place in the universe of the real story, like getting back to Vacuo somehow. I don't know why we left Remnant in general, you know, from the very beginning. I don't know why that was the decision the writers planned to have. But I do agree. I think Ruby excels when it focuses on just the characters. And I think that's a reason why volumes one through three were so much better, in my opinion. Because like, you know, uh, Blake being upset and needing to be convinced to go to the dance I think is a much more interesting concept and a much better written story arc compared to, oh, the maidens or whatever. <laughs> like, especially because I like these characters and when they're the focus and their troubles and tribulations are the focus of the story, I think that's when it excels the most. But I think they got so wrapped up in their own plot of the story that they've let the character-specific development kind of fall to the wayside. So yes, I totally agree. 100%. I wish they did it more, but also I feel like they could do both. I think they could do character stuff and also story stuff. But they tend to excel better with the character stuff. So maybe, I, maybe they should just focus on that. But I guess it's also too late. <laughs> uh, unless they come back for more, but we'll see. And then also, thank you, Bob Lob La La Bomb. I feel like I said it wrong. Bob Lob La La Bomb. I, th I guess that's it. <laughs> 
Monty would be upset. Miles took the spotlight for himself, volume 7 plus. I'd rather see better fight than outfit changes. I think Ruby is perfectly flawed. Okay, interesting. I don't think Miles took the spotlight for himself. But also, why did Jean fall? Right? <laughs> like, why did they make- Oh, I was really hoping it was gonna be a Tide ad. Damn. Yeah, like, why did Jean fall? You know, I- <laughs> It's easy, like, I think it's important to remember that there are four writers. It's not just Miles writing the story. But also, why did Jean fall? <laughs> why did Jean have to fall? You know, it's whatever. <laughs> um, I like outfits, so I'd rather get cool outfits. I'd rather get cool outfits and cool fight scenes. Yeah, if stream's lagging, it's on my end. It's me. It's because it's stormy and windy outside. So it's not you, it's me. <laughs> and then also, thank you, Wild Pilot. Are the Realm trailers by Pulp Anime on your radar? 1,000%. I've fallen in love with them. That Okay, fun fact, actually. that the, the Realm trailers are the things that inspired me to make my own OC Ruby team. Um, because I just, like, I just liked the style they had going for them. Uh... So I don't like- I'm not in love with the fact that they use AI for their voices, but I also understand, like, when you have no resources or anything, uh, I can understand, like, that perspective. But yes, I think they're super cool. I cannot wait. I subscribed to them. I can't wait. They're gonna have a new video premiering, I think, next week sometime about new, like, animation steps. They have so many videos on their channel for, uh, um, like, how to animate things with their animation software that they use. And I think they're so helpful and handy and convenient and well-worded. And so, yeah, I, I Pulp Anime, 10 out of 10. <laughs> if you haven't watched any of the Realm trailers yet, do so. <laughs> Ruby, Realm, they're small and cute, and I like them. The character designs are neat. <laughs> watch them the, the the third one that came out most recently uh, uh crazy <laughs> it got crazy <laughs> it was like not what i was expecting <laughs> come on stream what are you doing no the the, the razor ads <laughs> why would you do this <laughs> yeesh God, I'll have to hit- I'll have to re- I'll have to refresh the page and it's just gonna play the ads again. Oh, good. Oh, oh. It, it says it looks like you're having playback issues. Relo reloading the video may help. Jeez, LPD. Jeez, Louise. Are they on YouTube? Yes. Pulp anime. Ruby. Ruby. Realm. That's what they're called. <laughs> Isn't AI expensive? No, that's actually the exact opposite. AI is incredibly cheap and oftentimes free. And that's why uh, companies are trying to use it because they don't want to pay actual artists because they can do it for free if they use AI. <laughs> so. <laughs> At least it's not the razor ad. <laughs> it's not Gillette. Tide is better than Gillette any day of the week. We have learned already. <laughs> Our Tide ads weren't being a problem, but the moment the Gillette ads showed up, ooh, ooh suddenly it can't load properly. <laughs> we can't have problems like this on episode three of the volume. We have so much... Is the description of this episode really just what's your favorite fairy tale? <sighs> yeah. Tide, save me. <laughs> I hate AI art as you should. AI art is horrible and ugly and worthless. And if you use AI to make art pieces, then leave. And and leave forever. <laughs> 
stream keeps glitching, it's me. It's me. it's because it's so windy. My internet's just like it, like the moment it gets windy, my internet's just like I don't know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> people who use AI charge more than normal artists, though. Some companies in China had problems with it. It's because people who use AI really like scamming people because it's really easy to use, and they really love pretending like they are like the geniuses who make AI the best ever. Like they're like, I typed in the perfect exact thing into my generator and it made this beautiful, perfect piece because I'm so good at typing words. And it's like, it's not hard. <laughs> it's really not hard. But AI artists, artists, AI uh, users who are not artists and are in fact loser pieces of shit, <laughs> uh, just really like gassing themselves up because they actually don't have any talent or skill, but they love pretending they do. What's your favorite fairy tale critter? I think it's Red Riding Hood. I think uh, Red Riding Hood's fun to play around with conceptually, you know? Your headcanon is that Jin is evil and was lying to Ozpin to mess with him because all genies not voiced by Robin Williams slash Dan Castellaneta suck. Fascinating headcanon. Don't think it's true. <laughs> not just audio. My audio bad? Restart? Restart what? My whole stream? I can't do that. <laughs> I barely know how to use the internet, so I probably couldn't even do AI art. They had that one thing, that one, it was like, remember when that, like, at the beginning of AI art, it was like mid-journey, and everyone was making goofy, dumb-looking, uh, blurry images of dumb stuff. <laughs> and that was when everyone was like, yeah, this isn't too bad. And then all the AI bros was just like, I'll keep doing this more. See, it's better. And it's like, no, it's not better. It's very ugly and bad. Especially when you notice it, you know? When you notice, like, how AI it is, like, the fingers never look right. The poses are always weird. Proportions are always wrong. Someone's eyes are usually goofed up in some way. <laughs> Should I talk about the uh, the episode we're on? <laughs> Thank you, Ranger. Thank you. You rant about AI. Your rant about AI art reminds me of Jim Sterling saying stealing AI art is okay, and he is right. God bless Jim Sterling. <laughs> yes, steal AI art because they're stealing from other artists. So what does it matter? You're stealing from a stealer. <laughs> And thank you, Sora! If Ruby does continue, or gets a reboot, I hope we get new writers. I know some want to keep them the same writers, but I feel like if they do, the show will not improve. New writers will can do wonders. I think I'm up for either option. In my mind, what I think would be the perfect... Uh, in my... For me, the perfect scenario would be we get... Some of the old writers, but also include new writers as well. Just because Ruby has a lot going on in it. And new writers would have to do so much, like, homework for the show to get caught up on all of the things that's supposed to be happening. So I don't think a new writer would be able to catch all of the small, minute details that are involved with the show. So having one of the old writers around to, like, keep that stuff in mind, I think would be a good idea, you know? But also, at the same time, like, I agree, I don't think the 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 writers currently are, like, doing anything amazing <laughs> that no one else could do. It is It truly is just the sake of, um... It truly is just for the sake of having someone who remember who has an idea of like what all the lore is supposed to be like early on right from the bat because if someone else picked it up they were full of potential extremely poorly executed yes okay all right okay <laughs> okay i was thinking about this episode recently and specifically i was thinking about like how they've said they have said the writers have said that um they went back and rewrote this episode over and over and over again. They were like, oh, it, we just went through, like, like writing... Oh, my subtitles. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the writers have gone back and said that, like, they had to go back and rewrite the episode over and over and over again. And all this stuff... Let's lower the quality. 
like, what does it matter at this point? <laughs> they had to go back and rewrite the story over and over again because they were struggling with it. And like, yeah, you can tell because it's a bad story. And it, you can tell that they didn't, they didn't know how to like set up all the things that they've been hinting at. This is like the, the, the thing that it's supposed to be. Yeah, live is lagging. I can tell. My kilobytes per second is, like, diving down to, like, zero at times. Let me... Like, how bad is the storm? Oh, it's getting kind of bad out there. Hmm. Hmm. Getting real windy. It's fine when I'm not playing the... No, it's still diving up and down. <laughs> Yeah, let's lower the quality. Inspired by the writer's room for Ruby, right? <laughs> yeah, my kilobytes per second is going down to, like, nothing at times. I think I'm gonna lose power, actually. If anybody can hear me. <laughs> hmm, should I keep streaming? I think... Hold on. I'm gonna... I'm gonna... Gorilla, run away from my computer real quick. Because I'm gonna check outside... And I'm gonna check on my modem. Because I, I'm pretty sure it's the storm. <laughs> so... I'll play the episode, I guess, while I'm running away. I, I, I'm going. I'm, I'll be back. I'm going to go check. I'm going to check. I'll be back. <laughs> I'm going. I'll be back. I'm, I'm returning. I'm here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Still stable on your end? <laughs> do a flip? I, I, I can't. <laughs> I cannot do a flip. We'll keep streaming for a while. If it gets, like, bad, we'll, we'll call it. That's the thing. We don't really need to finish Volume 6. <laughs> we don't really need to watch any of them, really. <laughs> The important part is getting to volume 9 so we can see the new stuff that happens in volume 9, right? <sighs> Running up and down the stairs. The dang stairs. stairs. <laughs> and brave Sir Critter ran away. Bravely ran away away. <laughs> yeah, so like, what's- how's- how's the stream for you all? You know? Because if it's like not doing, then I'll just call a stream early and and we'll be like w like whatever. <laughs> we can we can pick it up some other time, you know. Because <laughs> like it's it, it is going up and down a lot, and it is pretty windy outside. <laughs> is that the 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 thing that's gonna goof up stream the most? Is the wind? Does wind really affect stream? Or am I crazy? Am I like an old lady who doesn't understand internet? <laughs> the stream's glitching bad for you. Pretty stable. All right, great. Stream's laggy, but if it gets worse, we can we can say. To uh, too bad, Archie had to reboot that because of Penders. What? <laughs> Glitchy, but I'm also on a train. Yeah. <laughs> Remember when Critter fought the vicious chicken of Bristol? <laughs> I feel like I'd remember that better. <laughs> Audio is smooth, but laggy visuals. Occasional lag or pauses. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we'll just keep going for a little while. Maybe it'll get better. Here, let me Google it on my phone. What? makes my OBS stream laggy. Let's see what Google has to say. Incorrect configuration of OBS settings. Well, that's not what it is. <laughs> what makes my OBS stream 
KBS low. Let's see. ISP network failing at some point of itself? What does that mean? What? <laughs> Is the ISP network failing at some point of itself? What does that mean? What's I- what's ISP? Help- <laughs> what, <laughs> what does that mean? I- ISP network failing at some point. What is an ISP network? What does that mean? <laughs> What is this? what what is internet? I don't understand. <laughs> I'm too bad with technology to be doing this. <laughs> Drew, I read your comment. <laughs> Drew off rain, I read your comment and I felt like I was having a stroke. <laughs> like I I was am I was amazed I understood what like some of those words mean. If you don't read the Sonic comics, woof <laughs> keeps turning off. Okay, yeah, it is me because it's because my KBS keeps going down to zero. Isn't ISP your digital address for the internet? How do I make that better for streaming? Why do you keep getting ads? Because I can't change it. Uh, it has it like. It, it YouTube changed its system so ads pop up in the middle of streams now, and it's dead. Internet service provider. What does that mean? So how do I make it better? How do I make stream better with that? What does that mean? <laughs> stream ends, but chat continues. Yeah, stream ended on your end. <laughs> Oh, thank you, furry giraffe. What's your thoughts on Salem's backstory? I think, I think it's too complicated for what it's supposed to be. I think that's the biggest thing. It's too complicated for being like the thing. Specifically, like she wanted Ozma back from the dead, and the gods were like, "No, we can't do that." And then they're like, "Oh man, we goofed up." So you know who we're gonna do? We're gonna bring Ozma back from the dead. And it's like, that, what, what do you mean? <laughs> that was the whole thing she wanted. If you just gave her what she wanted in the first place, then none of this would be a problem. You know? <laughs> if, if they just made Ozma alive again, none of this would have happened. And also, I don't know why they were like, oh, you know what we need to do? We need to, we need to like permanently torture this woman because she wanted her husband back. The love of her life was dead and she wanted him back. And she asked one of us and we said no. And then she pit us against each other for like three seconds. And to get back at her, we're gonna force her to never die. So now she can't even like, like die to be with her husband that she wants to see so badly. That's goofy. <laughs> that is goo- And then just to make him come back anyway. That's so goofy and and weird. It's so weird. It makes no sense. I it I don't get it. I, it doesn't- I don't understand why their reasoning was that. You can just tell. <laughs> you can just tell <laughs> that, that they didn't know what they wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, Murderbots teaser. I saw the teaser. I haven't watched it before. Maybe I'll watch it eventually. <laughs> yeah, murder drones. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one. Ah, flambly. <laughs> A good old flamble blamble. The gods were so petty. And that's the thing. If she had, like, done something actually insane, then, like, maybe that would make more sense. But from, like, what we see, like, in this episode, she makes them argue with each other for like five minutes and that's it. It's like, your brother said no, so I came, but I came to you first. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. And then the other one shows up, it's like, you're, that's not the rules. And he's like, you're just jealous. And it's like, no, she lied to you. It's like, oh, okay, never mind. And then they like torment her for the rest of eternity. I don't know, like, if she made like wars happen, if she was like playing God herself or something. You know- Yeesh. Ooh. I'm just- I'm just looking at my- What is it? Kilobytes per second? Is that what it, it is? 
this like this thing that OBS has on the corner. Is that what KB slash S is? Kilobytes per second? I just watched it like plummet. Just no nosedive to zero for like no reason. I wish I understood what it's like what it's gauging. How does it register what it's doing? You know? I wish I understood that part. So then I could make it better. But I'm dumb. <laughs> is it my computer? Is it something else? <laughs> What's the, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> When I'm not streaming, when I'm not playing something, it works fine. Is it that? Is it the internet? <laughs> Just in general? You know? <sighs> no. What? That, that, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> Thank you, Pippa Boxy. Do you think they've made Salem so overpowering that it would take a Deus Ex Machina just to defeat her? I think they wanted to. I think that's what they're aiming for. You know? Like, I think they wanted her to be very big and powerful and for there to be, like, no easy answer to, to stop her. You know? I think that that was the intention. But they also very clearly established that, oh, the problem is she needs to learn about the matters of life and death and stuff like that. So, yeah. Every time I play the, 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 the episode, it just nosedives. Is it just playing things? on stream that's making it bad <laughs> so yeah i think I, I like and yeah and also like silver eyes uh, uh, which is another thing they shot themselves in the foot they shot themselves in the foot because silver eyes kills grim almost instantly but and then they're like oh she could beat salem really easily so we need to come up with some th reason for uh, she's not really a grim but she looks like a, gl a Grim. She's clearly designed to look like a Grim, but we can't have her be a Grim. So they had to come up with this whole convoluted ass backstory to explain away why she looks like that. <laughs> yeah, I also thought Ruby's eyes would be the key. Cause that's the thing. I was thinking about this earlier that Ruby as a show seems like that thing where the the audience figured out the the plot twists but and then the writers got upset that we solved the the twist too early <laughs> so they changed their plot suddenly at the end to something different because they think surprising the audience with a twist is more important than having the satisfying narrative through line because we guessed it too early you know <laughs> Yeah, when I'm not playing the episode, stream runs so smoothly. It's just the episode. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> what? Why would it be like that? <laughs> Why would it work that way? <laughs> How am I supposed to watch the, the volume if I can't watch the volume? <laughs> Thank you, Sky Slasher. Uh, doesn't this make the silver eyes pointless? It does make them feel like that was the whole like, ooh, what's with her special silver eyes? And then we learn and then it's like, cool. So what does that mean? Nothing, really. Like, I guess if we walk up to Salem's castle, she could blast away the Grim pretty easily, if there are any. <sighs> but yeah, twists that exist for shock value are not storytelling. 100% yes. And that feels like what, like, they want to just, tw like, shock you. That's why they brought Penny back. Because Penny dying was a big shock value. And they like, oh, that's the thing that we need. We need more of that in our stories. <laughs> yeah, why don't we just talk about Ruby headcans for two hours instead, right? <laughs> I guess we could skip around the episodes. We don't need to sit here and watch the whole thing, I guess. If it's gonna be goofing up, like, we don't need to. Like, and then everyone dies, and then everything's fine. <laughs> we'll keep trying to go. But we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> and then I hit play, and I watch my kilobytes per second just plummet. <laughs> I, I, just, I don't understand. <laughs> What if I lower the quality? Will that help? Who knows? If I had a nickel for every time RT had a plot point from out of nowhere, I'd have a lot of nickels. Yes. The, or go nowhere. Yeah, they have so many things that feels like it should be setting up things. 
but it doesn't. <laughs> English and yeah, we'll keep it at 270, I guess. <laughs> You want to see the apathy episode? Apathy episode, at least. The apathy are among my fave grim. I hard agree. Yes. Yeah, I guess we'll keep going for a little bit longer. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, what is this episode? Does anything happen in this episode? You know what? I think we could skip this one, quite frankly. If we're, like, goofing around with things, we could skip this. We just see, like, okay. Here, let me, um... What happens in this episode? Uh, everyone's big upsetty spaghetti for no good reason. <laughs> uh, Crow punches Oscar uh, for no good reason. Um, uh, Emerald, Tyrion, and Hazel and Mercury hang out at Salem's lair. And Tyrion has this moment where he like cuts himself on Emerald's weapon. And it feels a little too sexual. <laughs> Okay, like, do you know what I'm- do you know what I'm saying? Like, the way he does it, it's just, uh, like, uh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I understand, but we're- we're trying to make him creepy, but, like, the <laughs> And then, um, after that, they immediately stand in front of Salem, and Salem is a big, screamy, whiny baby poo-poo. And it's so, like, not great, because she was established to be, like- like, all calm, cool, collected, motherly. And then they almost immediately abandoned that idea and had her the screaming, table-flipping uh, abuser that uh, no one- Everyone's clearly, like, scared around her. And just makes me go, why does anyone follow this woman? Why does anyone follow this woman? <laughs> no one- No one should be supporting this- Why- Why should any of these characters be here? Like, other- Like, they- They didn't have to come back. Emerald and Mercury could have abandoned ship at any point in time, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then they make it to the town, and that's it. It's a really short episode, so yeah, we'll just skip it. <laughs> we'll just go to the next one. We'll get, we'll get started on the apathy arc instead. The reaction to the table flip is funny, though. It is! It's- okay, and there's actually, like, a kind of sad moment where, uh, she flips the table- and you see she flips Tyrion with it, and he just, like, sadly lays on the ground and, like, gets back up. And, and it's like, aw. <laughs> like, he's weird, but he didn't deserve that. Thank you, Sky Slasher. Oscar just gets beat on his whole journey. It's, it's so true. <laughs> yeah, we, we, that, that, that's a reintroduction of Neo into the plot. Her design in... The Maya engine looks horrible. <laughs> it looks so horrible. They just don't do, like, colors good. Like, textures and colors. Her hair doesn't have the right curl to it. I... D <laughs> oh, right. Um, bam. Subtitles. There we go. Yeah. Oh joy, it's Neo. <laughs> that character who will get a redemption question mark at the end of volume nine? <laughs> Oscar is the literal punching bag character. It's it's so weird that that's the direction they go with his character after introducing him. After going through all this effort to introduce him into the plot and they just have him be like this sad, beat up, poor little baby guy. <laughs> This was a weird plot point as well. Thank you, Sora. Volume 6 is when I started to hate Team Ruby because of the whole setting, stealing the airship. I feel like they were always right and everyone else is wrong. Yes, I was mentioning this earlier, but it's like, they could easily have, like, better justifications for these actions to happen with the characters. Like, if they just actually, like, exhausted all other options or talked to each other just to, like, explain how none of the other options would work. But instead, they write it as Team Ruby gets their idea, and then they, they scream and yell at everyone who doesn't agree with them. <laughs> and it instead paints our characters as very petulant, you know? <laughs> uh, this plot point of Cinder goes to a what is this, a bar? <laughs> a person to help her find Team Ruby? 
And then Yo happens to show up at this moment, and they team back up with each other. Weird. Interesting. I feel like underutilized. Like, I liked the idea of Cinder being, like, out on her own and having to, like, figure it out without Salem's resources. You know, that was fun. But it's over so quickly. <laughs> yeah, Oscar's parents just not looking for him. I don't know if he even has parents. He never mentions his aunt. He never mentions his life before joining Team Ruby. He's just there. He's just this guy. He doesn't even seem to want to be in, like, the hero's team. He's just dragged along because the script says he's supposed to be important. But nothing about the actual personality of the character, like, like adds to that idea. <laughs> Was this show Ghost Rider written by Lily Orchard? They have about the same morality as her OCs. I never pay attention to Lily Orchard. Like, there's this big thing where, like, everyone's sitting here, like, uh, talking about how, like, bad she is at writing. And she is bad. 100%. <laughs> she has some, like, real, real stanky takes when it comes to, like, writing resources and whatever. Um, but I never, like, read any of her fan fictions or anything like that. I never paid attention to any of her stuff. The most I know of Lily Orchard was a long, long time ago, I watched her Steven Universe video. And then I also, I remember watching her Korra video, but I don't remember any of the things she said in either of those videos. Um, and then, uh, and then the most I know about her is like, like, uh, like her bad writing takes and stuff like that. So I have no idea how bad her OCs are, but I've heard, based on what I have heard, probably pretty bad. Who's Lily Orchard? Really not good. If you want a, a great um, breakdown on Lily Orchard's style, uh, look up uh, the podcast of Lily Orchard's writing tips. Lily Orchard's 100 writing tips on Dire Gentleman's ca channel. It's an amazing podcast. I've re-listened to it multiple times where they're just going through her 100 writing tips that she made and then promptly deleted off of Twitter because everyone was being like, these are really bad because they are very bad. It's, if you want to like learn about like what not to do with writing, that's a great way to do it by watching that podcast because also they do give good advice on what to do from a writing perspective. And they also have a follow-up video where they were like uh, actually having like real tips <laughs> so they they i learned a lot from them they're really cool remember when dire gentleman was pitching the idea of having a obvious ruby au concept where it was gonna be like a neo-noir type story and then the crazy ruby fanatics pooped all over their pants and completely threw the biggest baby tantrum because it was going to be an AU that was different from the show and how dare you make something that's not exactly the same as the show. And so then it never got made. I don't think he ever made his Ruby neo-noir AU thing. <laughs> And, and and it was, it was such a shame because I was like I'm just intrigued to see like someone else's perspective on the story, but instead the internet's goofy Tumblr losers bullied him into submission so he wouldn't make it because wah 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 I like it when Ruby is exactly one way. Any AU concepts are big bad and I hate it because it's not the same as my precious Ruby perfect proper. And uh, and I thought, yeah, yes, it does sound fire. <laughs> You're right, my POV. It was so neat. <laughs> and I was like, I can't wait to see what we're going to do with this. And then they didn't do anything. And that was a shame because Ruby fans are stupid. <laughs> and they don't understand that, like, internet fandom is a way to keep the show alive. But 
but they're so protective of keeping Ruby this proper specific thing that they actually discourage fandom interaction entirely. Like, no, you can't make fan art because that's not exactly the way I want it to be. No, you can't make fan fiction because it's not exactly the same as the show. No, you can't do any of the stuff. You just need to have the show fall into internet obscurity because it's too perfect and precious and it can't be any different than what we want it to be. Good job, Ruby fandom. <laughs> You've helped kill the show. <laughs> Alright. I haven't talked about Volume 6, like, at all <laughs> this entire time. <laughs> it's hard to talk about Volume 6, because especially it's slow early on. It's a lot of exposition. And it's a lot of stuff like I've said before, like like Salem's backstory. There's not much to really expand upon what I've already said. It's a lot of like, oh, uh, like a couple of little mini conflicts here and there. It's a good volume, I would say. It's just a bit of a slow one. I think this is the best mini arc they've ever had because there is a problem. They enter a town, everyone's dead in their beds, and there is no one here to give them the answers. They just need to solve the problem themselves. And it's it's them. They do it. These characters are the ones running around. It's not Team Juniper. You know, it's not it's not any like other random like the happy huntresses or anything, you know, it's Team Ruby. They need to figure out a way to, to leave in the morning. They need to figure out, like, why everyone's dead. And they need to get out. <laughs> and that's it. And they do it. And we gotta see how it affects these characters. And they solve the problems. And they talk to each other. I would have loved it if Oscar got to participate at all. Um, he never does. Because <laughs> the story doesn't like Oscar for some reason. <laughs> But yeah, I think it's great. I, I like, and I, I was so confused because it came out, and everyone's like, "These are filler episodes," and I'm like, "But they're the best ones." Oh, what? We're not talking about maidens right now. Every time we do talk about the plot proper, everything grinds to a halt as our characters sit around and listen to exposition about stuff. You know, I th and also as like we've been talking about it more recently, uh, like filler episodes are important for a show, right? Because this is where we're going to get the random moments with characterization, character development. It can't just be plot, all plot, all the time. The filler is where we're going to see the most humanizing moments for the characters. And also the moments where they can just, like, solve problems um, with, uh, with, like, consequence-free. You know, like, they can win or lose, and it won't have some major rippling effect on the plot, but it can be, like, a thing for them to, like, grow and develop by, you know? And I think we need to have more filler in general, <laughs> which is a weird thing. We the, the universe has done a 180 where we, we sat there and went, there's too much filler in all of our shows. There's not enough plot. I want more plot. And then everyone started doing that and that's why we have that's why seasons are like six episodes now six or eight episodes of like tv shows and and cartoons and whatever because back we're back in the old day they used to be like 16 you know double that because uh, half of it was just random filler stuff but now it's just the plot and it's less full the world is less full less fleshed out more filler more filler. <laughs> yeah, Adam's stalker art. I guess we could talk about that. Yeah, it's like having him stalk Blake is fine conceptually. Like I, I've talked about Adam so much. I just, I think the thing is. He never lived up to, like, the, the, I, like, I know that's a problem everyone has, was that he didn't live up to their expectations, he didn't live up to the threat level he initially seemed to possess, there was a lot of missed opportunity with Adam, 
And they a lot of people will talk will point out this volume and talk about like it like this is like the the, the nail in the coffin. Like this was the problem for Adam's character. And I'm going to say, no, it's not volume six's fault that the, uh, that the Adam stuff is, is like, works out the way it is. Volume six is just the ending of it. Um, what's with the blindfolded though? Oh, his blindfold. Like, it's like, um, it's a thin fabric so he can see. It's just not his white fang mask. Like, he can see through it. Like, uh, there's many fabrics that, like, like your shirt. Like, grab your shirt right now if you're in a place where this is socially acceptable. Grab your shirt and just pull it up over your eyes. You can probably still see through it slightly. And especially if you have, like, a pantyhose or something. And that's what I assume. Like, it looks solid black, but you can still see through it if you get it close enough to your eyes. I don't know why he ditched the white fang mask. I think it would have made more sense if it broke. If there was a fight. If he actually got to fight with Blake and Son, and someone landed a hit, and it broke his mask, and he ran away without it. And then he had to cover up his big ol' SDC scar some way. And he used some sort of fabric or maybe another makeshift mask. But instead he just abandons the mask. And I assume it's because he's giving, he's giving up on the white fang. And I think that's fine. I think they could have just like, like justified it better. But what I was saying was, uh, yeah, Adam just has pantyhose. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> he just like, keeps it in his pocket for special occasions. <laughs> um... But yeah, the thing is, I, Volume 6 was not the problem with Adam's character. Adam's character was a problem consecu- like consistently throughout the, the show. Because he wasn't in it at all. You know, his problem of not living up to his expectations was is not a fault of Volume 6. It's the fault of all the volumes up to Volume 6. Because he wasn't in Volume 1 at all. He was only in Volume 2 in the last, like, second. Oh boy, oh boy! The, we've made it to the unskippable Genlock ads. Hooray! The the Genlock ads that are burned into the footage, like the episodes. Yippee skippy! <laughs> Who doesn't love Schwenschblog? <laughs> Who doesn't love Grey Haddock's giant, big, expensive pet project to boost his ego? <laughs> Uh, thank you again, Sky Slasher. An eye patch would have sufficed. It would have, especially when you see Cinder's eye patch that she gets at the end of the volume for her new outfit. Like he could, he had so many options, <laughs> and he, I, 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 whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, they do still because they're like burned into the episode. They're like a part of it. They're not like a separate. Like you can see the ads are the yellow dots, you know. It's just a part of the exported episode. <laughs> yeah, like, Adam's not in the show. He wasn't in, like, volumes one through two. And then in volume three, he didn't, still didn't show up until the very end anyway. And then in, after immediately, like, introducing him, he disappears again. And then, and then, and then, and then like, he's not in volume four. <laughs> like, like, he's barely in the show. And that's the real problem. It's not volume six, like, deciding to kill off the character. Because, of course, it decided to kill off the character. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't adding anything to the plot. And he also didn't know about the plot. So, of course, they decided to kill him off. And he was also just, like, the last remaining thing to remind everyone about their poorly handled Faunus subplot. So, yeah, they made mistakes with Adam from the beginning. Like, he should have been in the show more from the very beginning. And I think that was the problem. Um, thank you so much, Ranger. Th- thank you, thank you. <laughs> My issue with this volume is the the whole backstory of the world and that this is humanity's second run. None of the main characters ever talk about it or had their worldview changed. They only focus on the Ozpin part. Yes, that is true. That is weird. You would think, like, if I learned this is humanity's second chance, 
I would be like, that's a lot. <laughs> like, I learned, like, and I think it's because they don't talk about religion in the show. So it's not like someone has to, like, have their religious perspective completely changed or whatever. Because they see what r- the reality of it actually is. They just move forward and focus on, like, the Ozpin thing. I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. It is very weird. I, I totally agree. <laughs> Um, and then George, thank you so much, George. Happy birthday, birthday boy George. I'm writing two prologues for my Ruby fanfic. One where Huntsman Squad finds my new enemy faction on a mission, and another where the faction steals experimental tech from a secret Elysian R&D base. It, that is crazy. <laughs> that is an extensive prologue. Good luck. I hope it works out. That sounds like a lot. You're setting up a lot right from the get-go. So I'm hooked. <laughs> Just got an ad for mini wheats. Mini wheats are dope. Mini wheats are so good. I always forget how good they are. <laughs> um, when I was sitting here, uh, when I was making my rant about um, uh, filler, I think I saw a comment of someone talking about me complaining about how Volume Nine is a filler arc. The, the, the thing I want to, like, clarify, because I can understand, because like, I'm bad at wording myself. <laughs> That's why I write scripts, so I can make sure I'm wording myself good. Having filler episodes is good. Having a filler season is not. You know? Especially where the company's at monetarily having an entire season of maybe filler, because we don't really know how much of Volume 9 is or isn't going to end up being filler in the long run, but having an entire season of filler that is completely disconnected from the world of the show is a weird choice, a weird gamble to make when you're struggling monetarily as a company. But having, like, episodes that are, like, filler arcs throughout the story, I think that helps. I think that's fun. I think that's a good way to expand, like, the runtime of the season while giving the characters something interesting to do that doesn't feel bogged down with exposition, you know? Does that make sense? Does that all make sense? Have I worded myself good? (laughs) Always make sure to take Critter's advice about filler and stuff. Thanks. <laughs> I try to take... The hard thing is taking my own advice. Because I'll sit here and say things. And then I'll sit down to do my own writing. And then all of the things I've ever said just echo loudly in my mind. And I'm like, I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> I'm doing it all wrong and everyone will know. <laughs> They'll know I'm, I'm a fraud. <laughs> Uh, the thing is, like, because I've been working on my AU story, and I'm still working on it. I think I'm on the last episode, but I also might add another episode in the middle that's a filler episode. I haven't decided yet, but I'm I'm getting closer and closer to finishing it. But also, I 100% understand that I'm going to have to go back and, like, do rewrites because I'm like, I need to add a lot more dialogue between these characters. I need to add better setup for this concept. So, you know, I think that's the biggest thing is that Ruby feels like a first draft. <laughs> I don't know how much of the their time is spent going back and like reworking dialogue and plot points and things because it doesn't feel like there's any. Beach episode, unfortunately not, <laughs> not yet. Maybe later. <laughs> I, I am excited. I, I talked about this once a while ago. I am excited to get to... Because my, my AU is only on Volume 1. I'm excited to get to Volume 2. So I can implement the plot point that I had a dream about. Which was every team gets a dog to accompany them on their Huntsman missions. Uh... Because Team Ruby gets his why, and in my dream, everyone's dog was based off of, like, a fairy tale fantasy dog from, like, various movies, like Balto, or the pug that the bad guy has in Pocahontas. That was another one of them. Uh, and I loved the idea, so I just can't wait for Volume 2, because everyone gets a dog, and I like dogs. <laughs> 
and I can't wait for volume two and everyone to have dogs. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Yeah, Bob, Bob, la, 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 Bob, la, 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 bomb. I think I'm getting better at saying it. Thank you so much. I seen you watched Arcane and League of Legends stuff. Have you watched the Legend of Vox Machina or Critical Role? I have. I actually have a uh, hour long review for the first season of Vox Machina. Uh, I've seen Critical Role. I've kind of fallen out of love with it. I might. I've been thinking about making a video about, um, uh, uh, like falling out of love with the with the company. It's just I feel like they are not using a lot of their resources very good. You know, um, also not, I wish they had diversified their cast because the last time I really enjoyed the show was when Robbie Damon was on and then he left and I was very disappointed and, you know, I, I, as much as I like the, the Critter crew, I'm kind of bored of them. <sighs> they, they tend to have the same ideas and gimmicks and it's fine. And it, it is fine, but they're also a multi-million dollar company. And I think they could be doing a lot more, you know? So maybe I'll make a video about it. I don't know. <laughs> critters are, are, are scary. The Critical Role Critters. <laughs> critical Role's fans are scary. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Stereotypical Gamer. Sorry if you mentioned this earlier in the stream and I missed it. But thoughts on Weiss's new scarf and leggings in her vo to her volume 4 look. I always forget. I haven't mentioned it. I don't think I've ever actually mentioned them on my channel in general. <laughs> I, I just, cause like it's, I like the red scarf. It's a nice touch. I just always forget she has it. <laughs> cause she also abandons it for like the majority of the climax of the volume. Like once they get to the t Kata Ark's house. She, she ditches it, and then during the, like, finale, she ditches it. I don't know. It's cute. The red scarf is very cute. I hope when Fixing Ruby does their rendition of Atlas outfits for everybody, I I hope a red scarf is, like, a staple for, for Weiss in some way. <laughs> Uh, I think it's cute. I forget about the leggings as well. Her, like, this dress has so many variations. There's, like, leggings edition. There's long skirt edition. It's a nice extra detail. It's a thing that I've been talking about. I'm like, I'm, I, I'm always talking about, like, ditching layers for the sake of, like, looking warmer in casual settings. But I appreciate the, like, like adding things to her look. Because hers does look the most cold. I mean, it is, okay, so she does look the most cold, but then also Blake and Yang are waltzing around with their whole tummies exposed to the to the elements, and they don't get anything like that. <laughs> so, I don't know. I'm like, I appreciate the effort that you went in for Weiss here, but I don't know why no one else got the same amount of effort, but it is cute. I do like the fact that it's red. It's a nice muted red, which is fun. The scar feels clunky but I like the leggings. I get why the scarf, it's cause they're bad with like fabric textures. <laughs> the whole show is kind of bad with fabric textures. And so I, that's why the scarf feels like really bulky, but also I've definitely had scarves that are like too thick and itchy and they just kind of like bunch up on your neck and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> what was I saying? Was I saying anything else? Oh yeah, I was talking about Critical Role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I had, I have that hour long review and I've thought about reviewing the second season. The problem is the second season just didn't really stand out to me enough. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'll make a video talking about why I've fallen out of love with Critical Role. I just, I'd rather watch Dimension 20. <laughs> Dimension 20 is more fun in every way. The editing's more fun, which is, uh, and that's also, it's hard to compare. Like, it's really impossible to compare because their styles are so different. You know, Dimension 20 episodes are an hour each, two hours maybe. Um, there's heavy editing, there's sound effects, there's music, there's all this stuff that goes into the after effects of it. Where with Critical Role, it's like live, like a live recording, and they're like seven hours each. So like from the get-go, they're just fundamentally different shows, and they're, that's what they're, they're not trying to be anything else than what they are. But I think the problem is that 
Dimension 20 can have like a rotating cast and an actually diverse cast, <laughs> where Critical Role is just the same eight people all the time, and after a while, I find them kind of boring. And also, they don't take their own story seriously. <laughs> like Matt, like too often, every time I see a clip from Critical Role, Matt is trying to talk about some like super dramatic thing that's going on. And then you just see like the others giggling because, oh, there's, there's some inside joke or whatever. Uh, making my way, goo, goo, goo. you know, after a while it gets a little tiresome, I'll, I'll just say. Thank you so much again, blah, 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 la bomb. <laughs> blah, 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 la bomb. Yeah, yes. Uh, last volume, you hated Blake's outfit. I disagreed. She was worried and scared, but already, but already ready in combat gear. Blake didn't know what to expect. Not the three. You mean the other three? Okay. <laughs> I understand. I mean, I get it. <laughs> I get it. Like, she didn't know what, what but like, what, what's when she's like hanging out at home. I don't know. I'm not a fan of this outfit for Blake in general. Yes, we're at the apathy. <laughs> Yahoo! The music is also amazing in this, in this, these episodes. <laughs> It's just really good music. When, when Ruby does background music, it's always good. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, went woke. <laughs> Leave. <laughs> no one wants you here. <laughs> oh, boo-hoo. Oh, diversity. Wah, wah, scares me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> went woke is just people's way of complaining about, like, uh, like... The just being bigoted to some way and they don't want to admit it. That's the only thing I ever see whenever people say, like, complain about quote-unquote wokeness is they want to be a bigot but they don't want to admit it so instead they hide under the guise of woke. <laughs> but yeah, when Ruby has background music, it's always good. And I think actually Volume 9's background music is amazing and it might be the best background music they've ever had. This is a very great moment as well. The biggest problem, in my mind, is uh, lots of times they just don't have background music. Like, it's a, it was especially a problem in volume four or five, maybe both of them, where there was just quiet. <laughs> it's, it's just quiet. <laughs> go woke, go broke, fuck off. That's so stupid. Oh, having like people of different skin tones and 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 sexual identities is the thing that killed the show. No, it's not. <laughs> You're just being a whiny baby. <laughs> Even Jeff was out. Are you stupid? You're uh, get out of here. <laughs> Yeah, go woke, go broke, motherfuckers on the Barbie movie. 100%, exactly. <laughs> Imagine being a grown-ass adult and using the word woke seriously. I know. It's just like, wah, wah. <laughs> Boo, I'm a white man and I don't like it when there's other things other than straight white mans in my shows because I'm, I'm not confident in who I am as a person <laughs> and I have un unpacked biases in my life but I don't want to admit it. Boo, boo, boo. watch the last fuckface episode? No, I'm not gonna watch it. It looks like a stupid show and I don't care. Also, Jeff and Gavin are dumb. Why would I care? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gavin, my favorite RT alum. Millionaire Gavin Free. <laughs> 
Oh, I, I can't wait to hear what he has to say about wokeness. Ooh. <laughs> Goofy. <laughs> Goofy as hell. <laughs> I don't like Jeff. I'm blasé, you know. Wasn't he one of the ones saying all those, like, swears and stuff and bigoted things to Caden? I think he apologized after the fact. But also, like, whatever. <laughs> well, they built this company. The illustrious company, Rooster Teeth. Who's shutting down? Wow. What heroes. <laughs> they built this company. Okay. And I care why. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you have a hard on for the the original Warner Brothers too? <laughs> the apathy theme music reminds me of the Rites of Spring. What is that? What are you talking about? That sounds like a Zelda thing. Rite of Spring. <laughs> I do, I, it is really good. I like how violent heavy it is. That's the biggest thing, you know? Like, like string instruments are good. <laughs> That's the fun part. And it really, like, hammers home that fear. Like, that, like, like heart panic feeling, you know? Does that make sense? Who's Jeff? I think they're referring to Jeff uh, Williams, the, the, uh... The, the guy who makes a lot of the music for Ruby and then stopped because obviously he stopped and then Casey Williams did it with her band. Okay, good night. His daughter. <laughs> um, thank you, Sekants. Sekants? I hope I'm saying it right. I'm not sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for showing us how to turn on our brains and critically watch shows. Being able to see flaws in a show proves you think about the show and use that thinking towards your own work. Thank you. And yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's a, it's, I, I think it's fun to look at things critically and to like dissect what makes them good, where you think they could be even better. I think that's a lot of fun, but you know, not everyone thinks critically like that, you know? Skip through Disney's original Fantasia. Oh! Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yes, 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 yes. I loved Fantasia back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a lot of fun to think critically. And I think there's a problem currently in, in media literacy. I keep seeing people talking about how media literacy is uh, a, a skill people are generally struggling with. So... I, what have Jeff and Gavin said? I have no idea. I haven't kept up with them in years. Like, I watch Ruby. I don't watch any of their other shows. I don't care about Jeff and Gavin uh, in a very long time. <laughs> I stopped watching Achievement Hunter ages ago. I don't watch their new show or their podcasts. So, But I do know when Caden was talking about uh, being... Um like, discriminated against for being trans. Gavin was definitely one of the ones who was saying it the most. You know? <sighs> you're watching a product produced by this company, yet you say shit on the same show you're profiting off of? Yeah. Thanks for the money. <laughs> boo, boo. You can't say bad things about a show. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so let me know how does the bottom of those boots taste when you're um, when you're licking Rooster Teeth's boots? Do they taste good? And how long does it take to brush the flavor out of your mouth? You know, can like a does it like does can a Tic Tac get the flavor, or does the boot kind of just linger? <laughs> that's just a that's just a goofy argument in my mind. You can't say something bad about it. Why? Do you think it's perfect? <laughs> Do people shrink so much when they get old? Not usually. And I think it's crazy because, like, people can shrink, you know? And uh, Maria's clearly Hispanic based on her last name, Calavera. Don't hit the other ad. <laughs> that was close. Did you see how we almost... <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, last name, Calavera. 
Uh, Hispanic, from what I've seen in my life, Hispanic folks do tend to shrink a lot when they get older. Um, not always, but it can, it does happen. Um, but never to that degree. It is a bit of a, uh, like a cartoon logic type deal that when people get old, they get really small and, and like shriveled up. I don't know why that's a thing. Like that's a go-to cartoon logic, you know? <laughs> but yeah. Um, no, it's just because when we see her as a, like a young adult, Maria is so tall. So for her to shrink so much, that was something I really liked um, with uh, Fixing Ruby was that when they had old Maria, she was still, like, kind of tall. Like, they clearly kept young Maria's design and made that their concept for how they wanted to do old Maria. Um, you sp By the way, Bob, you're spelling Monty's name wrong. Uh, so what they did was they took young Maria and then, like, logically figured out how tall she would be. Like, she's still clearly older. She's smaller and, like... Like, like a little hunched because of the oldness in her bones. But she's not like this tiny, shriveled up little, little lady. So I liked that. I liked, that was a nice little extra change with Fixing Ruby that I appreciated. Twins doesn't upload much? No, Twins streams mostly. I, uh, she's on Twitch. So, watch her stuff on Twitch. She's been streaming more often than not. Uh, I think? I think... I think she's halfway through Ocarina of Time. She's been playing Ocarina of Time. I don't think she beat it yet. You know? So, uh, if you... If I remember correctly, she just did the Shadow Temple? I think? <sighs> Sikants. <laughs> Calling out people's kinks. <laughs> Twins plays are for her streams. Yes, Twins plays. Two A's in plays. That's her VOD channel for her streams. She has some compilations on her normal channel that'll link to her VOD channel if you still need help finding it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think she's. I think she made it to the Shadow Temple. I don't think she made it to the Spirit Temple yet. She also does a lot of art streams, so that's a lot of fun. Um, she recently had a marathon stream, like a really big one, and I watched it all the way through. Uh, where she went through all of her old Ruby videos to, like, talk about her, how her opinions have changed over the years. I thought that was a lot of fun. It was a big old like, seven-hour-long marathon endurance stream. Great stuff. I loved it. <laughs> but also, I like hearing her talk about Ruby. That's the thing, is she just doesn't watch Ruby anymore. And I don't blame her. Not at all. Like, a lot of people ask me sometimes if I'll have her or Allison back on, like, a podcast to discuss Ruby. The thing is, they don't watch Ruby anymore. Because Ruby got bad, and I don't blame them. <laughs> so yeah, like, I can't have them on unless I- And I think they know the general idea of, like, what things happened with the latest volumes or whatever. But yeah, I don't blame them. Not in the slightest. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Again, George! Again, happy birthday, George. Everyone told George happy birthday. Because George is cool. Back in the day, I used a female Hypno for a Pokemon Crystal run. Her name was Siesta. Nice. And I always imagined her as the team's big sister. I was happy to hear Critter also has a soft spot for this one. Hypno's so cute. I love Hypno. <laughs> Everyone always makes fun of Hypno because of that one episode and the couple of descriptions and a couple of Pokedex entries, but it's fine. They're not all like that. Like, like, that's the thing. Like, all, people say, even in the games, because I've been... I started playing X version again yesterday. Um, if you're on my Discord, if you're a $2 patron, you can be in my Discord. <laughs> you Then you would have seen me talking about how I'm playing through Pokemon X version starting yesterday. Um, and I'm playing, and there's so many NPCs that are standing there being like, every Pokemon's different. Even if the, you think they're the same, they're actually all different. And they're talking about, like, natures and whatever. But also, that's true. Hypno, they're not all the same. Not all of them are creepy. And also, I really like Hypno's design. I like the soft thing. It's like, like, fur thing? That's fun. They seem huggable. They seem like they'd be good at hugs. So, also, I just really like Baku in general, which is the, uh, the yokai Drowsy slash Hypno are based on. Uh, 
And I think they're cool. <laughs> so I like Hypno. Hypno was my favorite for a very, very long time until Gorgeist. Gorgeist rolled up and just won me over. <laughs> it's just, it's everything I like. It's pumpkins and witches and scary. Yes. <laughs> I feel like I was going to say something. I feel like I was going to say something. Can I skip the lore and history parts of Fixing Ruby? Um... I think so. I tend to- the thing is, when I engaged with Fixing Ruby, I binged all of it in one sitting. Like, the first volume had come out, and I binged all of it in one sitting. And then, like, a year or two later, I binged the, like, volume two and three in one sitting. And so, what I always- I what I used to do is wait for the whole season to be out, and I would binge all of it. But then I joined the Sketchy Huntsman, and I was like, I should probably keep up with it. <laughs> now. <laughs> Am I into hypnosis? Actually, no. <laughs> uh, do you mean the move or like in reality? B the answer is no for both of them. <laughs> um, I don't like a lot of status effect moves in Pokemon. I am 100% that person that's like, hit hard. <laughs> no strategy, just hit hard. <laughs> uh, in reality, uh, hypnosis, I don't really believe in it. I don't think I could be hypnotized personally. I think, like, some people can, some people can't, apparently. That's the thing they say. I don't think I would be. Um, are you ready for the best character ever? It's Talk. Talk has so many very cool references to her fairy tale. She's based on TikTok from Peter Pan, the, the crocodile. And I think every single, every single thing about her and her design leans into that idea perfectly and it's the coolest i've been working on this big big dumb video <laughs> this i for so long now it's been months this huge ass video where i go over every single character and grim in Ruby to talk about what it is they're named after, what are their fairy tale inspirations, and going over every single thing that they are inspired by. All of them. Every single one. <laughs> and it's been tough, but I'm gonna start editing it soon. Finally. I Before stream started, I was getting footage from Alice in Wonderland because it is impo- here's a fun fact. It is impossible to find consistent quality Alice in Wonderland footage on YouTube. Like, you can find clips, but they're all different, like, aspect ratios. They're all different, like, 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 speeds. They're all different. <laughs> and so I had to go to Disney Plus and, and capture the footage myself. And I did that this morning before I started streaming. So I will start editing that together soon. Hopefully it won't take too long. I feel like it'll probably be like real easy actually. I think Talk is a faunus. Pretty sure she's an alligator faunus. I think that's what the teeth are or the scales. She also seems like the kind of person who would just, like, get a grill. <laughs> so definitely the scales imply faunus. I don't know if the teeth are related or not. <laughs> Is everyone staying hydrated? Is everyone drinking water and staying hydrated? Yay, water. <laughs> Heard Ruby was supposed to be a faunus or a wolf faunus or something. Yeah, they, they thought about it. Uh, they were gonna make her hair gray to allude to, like, wolf pelt colors. But I don't think they ever planned on having her being a faunus. Because I think that kind of beats Blake's purpose in the story. It's crazy that there's not more faunus characters, you know? <laughs> it's a, I, I pointed it out on Twitter, like, a while ago. But there has never been more than one faunus on a team before. There has never been an all-faunus team and there's never been more than one faunus per team. Some people think Fox is a faunus in Team Coffee. He is not. He's just a human who's named Fox. <laughs> Other than like the White Fangs forces in general, no team has had more than one faunus. And that includes the Aesops and the Happy Huntresses. One faunus only, every single time. And that's crazy to me. 
There's so many fairy tales that are animal related, and so many of them are characters in Ruby, and only one. A capybara faunus? What would they have as their animal trait? Maybe claws? Tiny little cute capybara ears? They have whiskers. We can have a little capybara, capybara whiskers. And capybaras are pretty cute. I don't think the cuteness would translate well to faunus features, though. It'd be like like that scene in um, Mean Girls when it's Halloween, and, and she was like, what are you supposed to be? And she's like, I'm a mouse, duh. And she was like, these are tiny, like, impossible to notice mouse ears. <laughs> Critter, did the Oscars happen? I don't think so. I'm amazed it's taken so long. I, I know, um, I, I didn't participate this time. I was very busy. I, like, uh, Cal asked, but I was like, I, I, I was having, because I was working on my Ever After High project already, and I also had, like, a lot of other stuff going on, like, in real life at the time. But it's taken a while. <laughs> uh, so I know it's supposed to happen soon. I don't know if it happened yet, but I didn't participate this time, unfortunately. I was just too busy. I will watch it when it comes out. But, yeah, I'm amazed it's been taking this long. I get, I probably editing has been the toughest thing, but also there's just like other stuff to talk about too, you know, like not a lot of people watched volume nine, I don't think, but I'm not sure. <laughs> what? <laughs> the capybara's innate aura of friend? You're not wrong. <laughs> You're not wrong, Hi Hayakiri, I think is how your name is pronounced. Capybara paws. You're so tiny little capybaras are cute. Rodentia. I like rodents. They're my favorite. Has anyone ever had pet ferrets before? I have. I've had four pet ferrets in my life. They were great. <laughs> I love them a lot. I wanted hamsters, but I was never allowed them. And now I have two giant banana boy dogs, and I definitely can't have hamsters. When I'm an old lady, I'm gonna have me some hamsters, probably. <laughs> Python faunus, long tail, or maybe a flexible body, the ability to unhinge their jaw, big ol' fangs that can pop out, that'd be cool. Thank you, Tori. Tori Miller. Thank you so much. Do you like the idea of Oscar being a deer faunus? I do. Who? Was it you? Someone suggested that. Somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold up. Hold up. Someone suggested the idea of Oscar being a deer faunus. Was it a thing I saw on Twitter? Was it fan art on Twitter? Was that what I saw? Ah, oh, I remember. I think it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's a cute idea. Dear Faunus is cute. I'm amazed there's not more of that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're right, Philip. <laughs> Aesop's needed their token Faunus. That was apparently the idea with Mero. Like, they hired, like they, they brought him on after Tortuga to, like, be their token Faunus. But they never talked about it. And that's also apparently why Lionheart is a Faunus. He's a Faunus because... A, a mistral supposedly like really racist and they wanted him to like be a figurehead to of change but they never talk about it there's just things they say in the director's commentary that is never seen in the actual show but yeah 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 yeah. dear oscar great idea 10 out of 10 idea doesn't fit with his fairy tale but whatever who cares <laughs> tipitarius does all kinds of stuff he could be a, a deer as well <laughs> But yeah, like, that's cute. And we could have, like, Bambi vibes with him also. 10 out of 10. I want more. And also, deer antlers are adorable. And also, he has freckles. And you know what's cute? Deer spots. Like freckles. Those spots that they have when they're babies, like Bambi. That, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> deer Oscar. And also, deer Oscar, you will be a deer Oscar. <laughs> Yeah, 10 out of 10 idea. I What a weird moment for this show. I, I'm talking about the show again. Haven't been doing that for a while. Um, ha, th That whole moment of them being, like, amazed and, like, goo-goo-eyed because Jean's sister is there. I, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> like, I don't get what they were going for. I don't think... Miles and Carrie, because this is only Miles and Carrie writing this volume at this point. Uh, the others hadn't joined yet. I don't think Miles and Carrie understand comedy. And I think that's the biggest 
problem. But it's weird because they do. Because volumes one through three are really funny. I don't understand what happened with their sense of comedic timing. I feel like someone was probably helping them before in volumes one. There was probably some other force helping them in volumes one through three. Or someone else, like their shift. Like something, something's different. Something about the comedy just greatly changed between volumes one through three and then four onward. And the comedy just nosedives, and I don't think they know what they're doing with it. <laughs> I'm amazed we never saw more of Jean's sisters. I'm actually, and since we're quickly approaching the stupid statue scene, I don't understand why, like, Juniper's parents were never a thing in general. Like, Pyrrha died, you would think her family's fallout from that would have played a bigger role in Juniper's specific development but but they don't do that I, was, I hate this scene i hate ruby in the i, I god god yeah yeah just comedy <laughs> the, the, the worst moments are always the comedy <laughs> maybe monty was a funny guy maybe i because the thing that i'm thinking about i i don't think it was monty because he seems like yeah like i don't i feel like it was probably someone like bernie instead i feel like like, one of them was dipping in and offering suggestions about comedy and stuff. Or maybe, maybe Miles and Carrie or one of them had a natural idea for comedy and then tried to study it and lost their natural sense of comedy because they're trying too hard. Maybe that's what it is. It just You can tell something's different. The comedy just does not hit anymore. And I don't understand what happened. <laughs> I don't know what was happening before, and I don't know why it changed. That's the biggest thing. Caribou? <laughs> or maybe one of them should be a caribou? Yes. <laughs> Giant. Unwieldy. <laughs> cumbersome antlers. <laughs> of a caribou. <laughs> Hell yes. <laughs> I think their comedy comes from crunch, exhaustion, and not bouncing off people who aren't yes-men. Yeah, I've always had the idea that Rooster Teeth is filled to the brim with yes-men. It is just constant yes-men, especially as volumes go on. Um, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, also I think the thing is, a lot of their like comedy that worked really well in volumes 1 through 3 was like witty dialogue. That was the, th the stuff that was funny was, like, good banter and dialogue and the, like, speed and back and forth of their dialogue. There are a couple of visual gags that really hit. Like, when they deliver Zwei in the mail, that's a really funny moment. But it's mostly their dialogue that is actually funny. And I think with volumes, uh, like, f four onward, they try to rely on visual comedy a lot more. And I think that's where they struggle. They just don't get the visual impact as good as I think they should. You know? <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. Thank you so much, Viva Voxy. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. A lot of the stuff the crew say in the commentaries is one of the reasons why I don't really listen to them. Especially the stuff in Volume 7 and 8. Yeah, I never listened to Volumes 7 or 8's commentary. Because I never bought the DVDs. Because I was like, I don't... I don't think they'd be worth it. As much as I liked Volume 7, I was like, I, th I don't want to buy that. <laughs> There's not enough on the DVD that makes it worth it. And then Volume 8 was horrible and terrible, and I definitely didn't want to buy it. But yeah, like, like I would engage with all of that stuff, and I would watch all those commentaries and everything. And then I was like, it, you're cheating. You're trying to use your commentary to fill in the gaps for your story that you're not doing with your actual show and that's not fair and and it, it's all it, it might as well be meaningless because it is because it's not in the show if it's not in the actual show then it might as well not exist you know oh geez the minute long stupid genlock ad <laughs> what am i looking at oh it's the uh, uh. Okay. <laughs> it's 
Sorry, hold on, I had to scroll past the Jan lock out. <laughs> Yeah, if it's not in the show, then it doesn't matter. And they will use their... It's not just the, the commentary, but they do it a lot in the commentary. But it's also their Q&A podcasts and their their Twitters and their live streams and their their, their this, their that, their all these things. And they, they sit there and cheat with their storytelling constantly through other means. Um, Critter, are there any volumes you would... That you would rewatch that are worth buying physical editions for? Uh, I had, me and my sister had the DVDs for volumes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. We had the DVDs for those 6. I think she got rid of most of them. She kept most of them. I still have 6 uh, because she bought it for me because I liked volume 6 better. Uh, if I had to, I maybe volumes... No, because there's nothing on the DVD that I couldn't find on YouTube, you know? Like, they don't offer any- they don't offer an experience that would be worth spending the money on, you know? <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, I wouldn't be getting anything new. And then also, thank you, L Lash- L La- Lashizel? Lash- Lashizel? Lashizel. I'm sure- I said it wrong both of those times. So <laughs> I don't think I got it right at all. But thank you so much. <laughs> Love the watch-alongs. It's criminal that Oscar's development got skipped over. This cemented the idea for me that Oscar is not a character. He's not. You're so right. And thank you. <laughs> you didn't get skipped. I was just babbling. <laughs> um, he's not. You're so right. He's not a character. He's barely a concept. And it makes me curious why they did this. Like, why was this the decision they went with? You know, oh, Ozpin's gonna die and he's gonna get reincarnated into the, the mind of this little farm boy. Oh, okay. And then they just forgot to do anything with the farm boy. And I think it doesn't help that there's a lot of characters already and they already clearly struggle with um, giving any of them development. You know, that's why we like... <laughs> Like, had to have all of Volume 9 in a different, unrelated universe because they couldn't develop Ruby and do their normal plot stuff. But it's like, it's just, it is weird. <laughs> it is very weird that they introduced Oscar and then just didn't do anything with him. He doesn't talk to anybody. Every time there's a scene where all the characters are together, he's always gone. Like, in Volume 5, when they're all, like, eating dinner together because they've reunited, he's not there. During the entire Apathy arc, where they're running around with Maria, Maria gets to participate, but not Oscar. He's not there. He's upstairs inflating a tire or whatever. In Volume... In the next one, Volume 7, when they all get their Huntsman licenses and they're all celebrating, he's not there. Penny gets to be there. You know, back from the dead Penny. She gets to hang out and participate. But not, not Oscar. Oscar, and then he gets kidnapped. And he's completely separated from the, the, the majority of the time in Volume 8. And then he doesn't fall in Volume 9. So he consistently just is excluded. And it's weird. Because you could just so easily include him. In, except for the getting kidnapped subplot for Volume 8. Just to have him be there when they're celebrating. When they're talking when they're doing their apathy misadventure, have him also fall into the Ever After. I feel like they could have had anyone other than John fall and it would have been a better idea. Like, literally any character. Why only John? Why just John? Like, and I, and I was just rooting for John too. Like, I was like, we've done it. He's not a bad character anymore. We've broken free of the annoying Jean-ness. He's fine now. And we can stop insisting that that he's Miles' self-insert. We can he's just a normal character. And everything's gonna be better. And then he was the only other one to fall into the stupid ever after. And it all came tumbling back. <laughs> I adore Caroline Cordovan. I think she is the funnest little character. She's just a goofy, Team Rocket-esque 
adversary for them to face in this in this volume, especially with how heavy the rest of it is. Like learning about you know Ozma's backstory and everything, and then like the the Adam fight with the bees. Like uh, everything around her is very serious, so having her be a bit of brevity, but still a thing they need to fight to to save the day. I like her. I think she's fun. <laughs> I think she's underappreciated in the fandom. <laughs> But just like everything else that I've been saying, is like I, I feel like her reasoning for not having them go could have been better. Because they kind of just like hand wave it away. They're like, oh, she's not letting you go. And it's like, jumping to steal the airship feels so extreme. Because she's not even like really saying you can't go. No one did a good job explaining why they should go. Weiss could go on her own and they don't explain why they don't go with that idea. <laughs> and it's just uh, just kind of sloppy writing. At least it's better than volume 5. We can agree. Their turnaround from how like atrocious volume 5 was was really big. Volume 6 is surprisingly great given how bad volume five was. Um, but I think uh, a bit of a problem, because of, uh, volume five's biggest problem was that it was slow and boring and ugly. Volume six, I think, it fixes a lot of that problems, but it starts the new problem of, like, kind of speed running plot points, like rushing over things, not spending the time on certain, like, items to fully develop them into the thing that they should be to really justify the plot points. Does that make sense? Like, it, like if we just stayed on this a little bit more. And thank you so much again, Tori Miller. I still like Oscar since he did a lot more than the others did. Plus, if Oscar fell, he would have noticed what was happening with Ruby, in my opinion. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think there was so much potential. Like, because a, a whole volume where it's not all of these characters, there's a lot of characters in our main team. So having it just be Team Ruby and an extra, having any... And in, it's such an emotionally turbulent volume as well. So having it be Jean again... Especially after all the emotionally turbulent moments he gets throughout volumes 4, 5, and 6. It just felt very boring. Very samey. Like they're just repeating the same plot points with him. And that's another big problem with Rooster Teeth. They just repeat plot points. Oh! Penny's dead? Well, we'll bring her back. So we can kill her again. That's a great plot point, so we'll just do it again. <laughs> Jean just got over all of his emotional turbulence, so you know what we'll do? We'll give him new emotional turbulence. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> Oscar got, like, separated from the team, and then he reunited with the team, just to get separated from the team again. Within, like, episodes of each other. Because he's separated from everyone else when, like, like Ironwood... Okay, so, like, the attack is happening and Juniper forgets him and he goes running off to take care of Ironwood. And then Ironwood has this whole To my friends, it's James. To you, it's General Plow. And then he's separated from everybody. Uh, but then he immediately reunites with them at the beginning of the next episode. And then, then one episode later, he gets separated again because the hound takes him. And I'm like, why? Why do we do? This? I just don't get it. <laughs> like, like they're just doing. They're just repeating plot points constantly. A lot of the show feels stuck on repeat. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, Mystic Orange. <laughs> I didn't know you could include gifts <laughs> into super chats. <laughs> So that's fun. <laughs> uh, and thank you, JK Network. What are your thoughts on White Rose? Because I know your thoughts on Bumblebee, but what about the concept of White Rose? Not in happening, just the concept. Because I think they have more chemistry than with Jean or Oscar, in my opinion. I, I'm fine with White Rose. I'm like, like, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Like, it could happen canonically in the show, and I'd still be pretty okay. Like, I think they have enough of a bond where it could stay as 
great friends, like how they currently are. Or it could develop into something romantic down the line. I think it would be more natural than Bumblebee ended up being. Just because they've kind of consistently been, like, really close with each other for a longer. I think it's cute. Like, I think it's fine. There's some very cute fan art out there. I do like White Knight more, personally. Because I'm a sucker for uh, the rich, cool, awesome girl and her uh, bit of a goof doing his best himbo boyfriend. (laughs) Um, Over the years, I've kind of changed my mind. Like, I'm I'm fine with Rose Garden still, but the more, like, I go, the more I'm like, Ruby's not gonna marry anybody. She's married to her job. She wouldn't settle down, ever. She wouldn't do the thing her mother did, which is have kids just to continue to go back out there and put yourself in danger and potentially have to leave your kids behind at too young of an age because something happens to you because it's too dangerous. So, you know, uh, I'm just kind of neutral. I'm pretty neutral for most ships. I don't think there's many ships that I, like, hate, except for, like, the incest ones. Um, But, yeah, I'm pretty neutral for most. Like, any of them, I could be like, I see where you're coming from. I get that. (laughs) Ugh. Girl boss and fail husband. Yes, overhyping. That is the- yes. <laughs> that is the best way of putting it. <laughs> Girl boss and male wife? Yes, similar. <laughs> a, a, a Venn diagram, those two. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I, uh, the thing is, I'll, all I'll need is one good fan art of a ship. And that'll be enough to convince me. Like, I saw one piece of fan art of, like, a Blake X Velvet ship. And that I was like, yep, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> Blake X Velvet. Another big one is Blake X Ilya. That's a cute one. I've, I've, adopted, I've adopted a new OTP for Blake while I was working on my AU. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, because I don't want to spoil anything. But it's a, it's a real wacky one. And I guarantee I'm the only one. <laughs> I'm the only one shipping Blake with this person. <laughs> but. There, who cares? Because <laughs> I was like, maybe I'll have Blake and Yang get together throughout the process of my AU. I don't really mind. And then as I was writing, I was like, never mind. I've fallen in love with this other one. <laughs> so. <laughs> Is Jean, is that Jean you're spelling? Jean and Nora a popular ship? I don't think so. I think Nora most popularly is like Ren and then also Pira was her other most popular ship. I think Jean and Nora would be fine. I could see it. I, here's the thing. I think a lot of Jean ships are cute in theory because he seems like a very cute, just like romance partner. So, a lot of ships that involve Sean, I think, have, like, potential for cuteness. Fan art of Tyrion X. Watts. A surprising- not a lot of fan art. Some fan fiction here or there. And I don't really read fan fiction, but, like, like, because I, I, it was when, like, they were just being introduced, and I was checking out what fan fictions were coming out at the time, and I was surprised at how many Watts X. Tyrion things there are. Uh, I see it. I get it. I don't ship it, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, the scene is so long. Like, the, the, you know what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying earlier? When they just sit down and, like, exposit at each other. That, like, that's, it's so boring. And a lot of the scene is, like, and I didn't realize how bad the scene was until I rewatched the episode. Because I watched it when it came out and I was like, that's fine. And then I rewatched it to get my footage for it. And then as I was sitting there, I was like, oh, this sucks, actually. It's a lot of, like, theory and, oh, the light and the dark and the darkness of the light. The the symbolism of the purity and the pure of heart and the dark and destruction. It's a lot of, like, like non-concepts, like, like ideals, not really things. It's also a lot of, uh... Maria's own backstory for some reason, which I think is fine. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's a very boring scene. The visuals are boring. What Maria has to say is more concept than helpful. The important parts is at the very end. 
And I'm like, we could have started with this. <laughs> so I think it's, I get what they were going for. And they, you know what they did better than some? The butterflies help a lot. The butterflies and her like fruit tray are doing a lot to carry the scene. Uh, but if you really focus on what she's actually saying, it's a uh, less of a conversation than I wanted it to be. But it could be worse, I suppose. They've had worse. <laughs> Thank you again, JK Network. You're being so kind today. You're being so kind and I appreciate you. <laughs> um, also, is it a hot take for me to say Adam is the worst major villain in Ruby? I don't think it's a hot take because I 100% agree with you. Oof. <laughs> I never understood the hype and he was always cartoonishly evil. He got worse and worse of all... Oh, he got worse and worse of all. He has zero story relevance to Salem, plus his dialogue. 100% I agree with you, 100%. In every single regard, I agree with you. Every single- yes. 1 million percent. I agree with everything you just said. I think he is lame and boring. He doesn't know or- if he either doesn't know about the maidens and the relics, or he doesn't care. Either is- and by volume 6, we can't afford to have random goof-ass characters who aren't related to the plot. This is volume six, you know? <laughs> like, like we're in the middle of the throes of it. We're in the thick of the plot now, you know? It's, like, this is the volume where we learn what Ozma's backstory is with Salem. This is the, the, the volume we learn what the relics got going on. This is, like, the, the, the like, it's happening. <laughs> and so to have this guy who's still, like, oh, but the the white fang. It's like, that's so six years ago, dude. What are you, stuck in volume one? We're in volume six right now. We got things to do. And he, and you're also totally right. His dialogue has always been so bad. He's very, you're right. He does feel cartoonishly evil. He feels like a cartoon villain with his mwahaha, and I will, and I will take over the world, pinky in the brain style. He doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't engage with other characters. He is dumb and bad. And I was talking about it before, like how he just doesn't get enough screen time to like establish anything. And it all just kind of like comes crashing in on itself in this volume and I'm so glad like this is the end of him and it's also a good thing to show that our characters are like succeeding incrementally you know like they're beating their villains as time progresses and having them beat Adam is a fine way to like set it up and also I don't think he could have been interesting moving into the later volumes of the series so I I 100% agree. Overrated, so overrated, and all of the like Adam fanboys are the most annoying because it's like he wasn't even cool. The stuff with like Ironwood is also kind of annoying, but at least Ironwood like had concepts. He stuck around. He had things he did. He had things he said. He had an impact. Adam is like a cool character design and nothing else. <laughs> like yeah, his weapon is cool. He his moment in the black trailer is dope. But he was never any more interesting than a concept. He's just concept art incarnate. Uh, and thank you, Godzilla Slayer. In my opinion, White Rose is superior to Bumblebee. I get that. I think that's the thing. Bumblebee is like such a like a vanilla ship. <laughs> it's like even before it was canon. It's like yeah, that's fine. But also like yawn. <laughs> it was like when people were like I ship. What's a what's a good example to go with? Like I ship. Harry and Hermione for like Harry Potter and I'm like okay but that's pretty boring <laughs> is your favorite flavor water <laughs> what a what a what an interesting wow you're really breaking the norm and like Blake and Yang are fine they just look cool together because their color palettes are complementary I think there's just much more interesting. I, I, the only one that's like on the same level of boring than that is uh, Blake X Sun. Oh, it's the it's it's Mercury scene. <laughs> it's the scene where he's like, my dad stole my semblance, and I'm like, that seems so important. <laughs> that's such a big thing to finally reveal now, and then it doesn't even go anywhere. It just seems like an in-universe explanation to excuse away why he hasn't had a semblance reveal yet. 
because they actually uh, really don't like writing semblances. They think the superpowers of their world is boring for some reason. But and I'm like, but that, that that seems so weird. <laughs> Water is delicious, and you should all stay hydrated. And also, uh, like and comment and subscribe. <laughs> Yeah, that's so weird. That seems like such a- there seems like Mercury could be having his whole own development. He's going- he- like, the stuff he's gone through as a character. Assassin father who was abusive, lost his legs, uncertain if it was related to the assassin father abuse or not, but he lost his legs and had to get new metal ones, and it was obviously like a hack job. You know, like, like, uh, the bandages shouldn't have been bleeding that much. <laughs> and he had his own semblance stolen by the assassin father. T Mercury has so much of a character. There is so much in that boy, development and establishment wise. And he does nothing. He's just in the background being like a nothing background character. A, a, a toady for Cinder. And it's so weird because it's like he should have- there's he has so much going on. That is so much stuff, right? <laughs> he could be doing so much more. And I think the biggest problem is that his design is really boring. Like, like he's kind of a bland color palette of a character. Like, all the grays. He's just kind of simplistic, so he gets ignored a lot. Everyone was sitting there creaming their pants because Emerald was really pretty and cool, and they're like, I can't wait for her to become a good guy. And yeah, that ended up happening, but I'm the only one over here being like, Mercury's got a lot going on. <laughs> and I think we're not focusing on it enough. <laughs> um, thank you again, George. Uh, I also enjoy Yang and Neon a lot, considering she's the more fun cat. I agree. I really agree. Also, I was thinking about redoing the Justice League crossover and pairing Nora with Static. Oh my god! That's a great idea! Oh my god! That's a great idea! <laughs> static Shock. More Static Shock in my life would be better in general. God, I miss that one. I want them to remake Static Shock. I want them to do more Static Shock in general, because he was an amazing superhero, and I loved that. I loved that show. It was so much fun. Um, the thing is, okay, every single time I think about the Justice League crossover, I just think about a million other characters that would have been more interesting to be in the crossover than the regular boring-ass Justice League. Like, the Justice League are fine, but Teen Titans would have been better. Now, Static Shock would have been better. A million other characters would have been better, but no. Superman and Batman, because Miles and Carrie are big Superman Batman fanboys. <laughs> Fan fiction where Mercury had silver eyes and he ended up joining the heroes to help defeat Salem. Nice. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'll make him have silver eyes in my AU. Because, like, having multiple characters with silver eyes just seems like a more interesting concept. Thank you again, Godzilla. Mercury is like DBZ movie villains, better in concept. <laughs> wow, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> but it's one, one thing, okay, when it's a movie, though, it's like, oh, that's because it's a, it's a 60 minute, like, random misadventure. That's one thing. But, uh, do I have my quality lowered? Did I forget to do that? No, I did. Yeah, sorry. It's a, movie, like it's a 60 minute adventure, right? But when it's the show, the whole show, <laughs> like, like from the beginning to end, Mercury as a character in the show. <laughs> Mercury x Adam is Iron Bull. That's a great ship name. See, this is the thing. Sometimes the Ruby fandom really, really like, popped off with a great ship name, just for the pun value alone. But and then it's like, oh, what's that ship? Oh, these two characters that have never talked to each other. <laughs> Critters writing an AU? I am. And I'm almost done. It's gonna be 10, maybe 11 episodes long. Definitely 10. I might go back and add an extra, like, filler episode in the middle, so it'll be 11. I'm almost done with it. I am very excited. I'm excited. I hope you all like it. I change up a lot. Like, it's real crazy. Um, but in a good way. 
Oh, thank you again, JK Network. You're being so ni dang nice. You're being nice, and I appreciate you so much. <laughs> Um, kind of wish they kept Mercury's rivalry with Yang. It felt like boring Adam... What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Might be. It felt like boring Adam replaced him to be Yang's arch-rival. Also, if I had to ship Yang with a guy, it would be Mercury. Enemies to lovers thing. 100% all of that. Yang x Mercury also. Lots of great fan art for them. Um, and the, like, Gauntlets and Greaves thing, it is cute. And the yellow and gray do pair nicely together. So... Yes, 100%. And also, he just, like, because we said we set it up, Yang gets set up with so many rivals that feel like it should work. Like, first it was her and Neo with the train fight. And then in Volume 3, it was her and Mercury. And, and then they just abandoned both of those concepts over time. And I, I'm so bummed by it. And now I'm like, she could have something with Hazel, but then Hazel died. I don't, <laughs> it, it's dumb because Adam was clearly Blake's rival and then they kind of lumped him into Yang as well and I think it just didn't work well that way yeah it's the statue scene we're here oh boo hoo ya boo boo poor Pira everyone cry over your your precious dead princess is that a thing that's a thing from twins's review for this episode and 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 the way her review for this episode is the best thing ever. She words it perfectly. <laughs> Everyone's precious dead princess Pira. Everyone loves her. Oh no, be sad. Remember when the show was good? Remember back when the show was really good when Pira was around? Be sad about it. <laughs> um, thank you, Ranger. Thank you so much. Hot take. I dislike Mercury almost as much as Adam. <gasps> Spicy hot take. How dare. I don't blame you. He's very boring. Mostly because Mercury story-wise does not do much without Emerald. Also, Protag says hi. Hi, Protag. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, hi. <laughs> I've seen you. I'm just, I've been babbling. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, I 100% agree. Hey, like, having a character be, like... Because it's weird, because Emerald gets to do a lot, even without Mercury. Like, she's gone through development, with or without him. But he just always feels like like a, a tag-along, like a toady. And there's, like, he, he, and he barely gets to do anything in the show. Which is crazy, because you know who does an amazing job? Yuri Lowenthal. Yuri Lowenthal does an amazing job voicing Mercury. And it's a shame, because Mercury never gets to do anything. Such a shame. Wasted potential. You know what? Um, justice. Justice for Mercury. <laughs> justice for Mercury. Hashtag justice for Mercury. Thank you again, JK Network. Anytime. I enjoy your streams. Also, I'm curious on your thoughts on Hazel getting redeemed instead of Ironwood. Both sympathetic and beef with, beef with Ozpin. I think it is pretty hypocritical in it. Because, <laughs> like... Especially because Hazel, like, tortured Oscar. I was mentioning this last time. That he, like, has a whole thing in Volume 8 with him, like, wholesale torturing Oscar. But he gets a redemption arc. He gets to, he gets to redeem himself at the end there. He gets to be the little hero and, and has his moment. And his whole motivation was goofy at best. But he got to have his whole redeeming thing. But... Ironwood was never a villain, you know? Like, they made him one. Like, like they made him shoot innocent civilians and blast away Oscar. I don't blame him for, for shooting Oscar, I will say, you know? Because in his mind, he was like, I want Ozpin back. Get him out of the boy, <laughs> and he'll go to a different body. Like, I can understand what he was- like- I get, I understand. Especially because he's like, Os Oscar's lying to me. They straight up lied to me the whole time. At that point, he probably didn't even know if he actually was Ozpin's next in line. Because they had lied about everything at that point. He might have been, like, at that point, Ozpin, like, Ironwood might have been like, is Ozpin even actually in this child? Because they had lied about everything at that point, so he had no reason to believe them anymore. So, I, I... Perhaps extreme, but also I understand. Uh, but then he turns around and shoots Sleet for no reason, and they make him a goofy, goof, Scooby-Doo villain. But um, yeah, I think I think 
they they should have played with Ironwood being not an anti- I guess anti-hero is the best way we could word it. Like, he's not aligned exactly with the heroes, but he's also not doing things the way- Like, he's not a villain either. But instead, they just made him a wholesale villain, because why have nuance in your interesting show? You know? <laughs> why they do a great job setting up the idea of nuance and having very nuanced topics- but then, whoopsie poopsie, we just forgot about that part. <laughs> just just make it all bad and black and white. Uh, thank you again, Sora. Is the show setting up Emerald X Mercury? I don't know. It's hard to tell. It might be. I never saw them as romantic. I always saw them as, like, exclusively sibling-coded, you know? Um, and I think that's where they're the cutest, conceptually. Uh, per- per- perhaps Emerald likes Cinder? I always read the idea that, like, the one I see her interactions about Cinder, I thought Emerald had a crush on Cinder. But then Ruby Chivy came out and implied it's, like, a motherly thing. Like, she thinks Cinder's the mother she never had. So I don't know. <laughs> I personally like uh, Emerald and Mercury being siblings, but I totally understand if you, like, have, like, a, sh- like, because they're so not in the show enough to establish it one way or the other. So if you see them as, like, uh, shipped, I get it. <laughs> I like to think of them as siblings. <laughs> Thank you again, Vivavoxy. I did a scenario where I said if you were to remove Hazel from the story, you could still achieve the same story beats regardless Oh, regarding Oscar and Emerald, 100%. And it might have actually been better that way. Because cutting Hazel out of, like, everything with Volume 5 changes nothing. He was just a thing to fight. But it's specifically at the end with when Oscar, like, shows Jin to, to Hazel and Emerald is there too. If it was just Emerald, because Hazel was sitting there torturing him all this time. But we were trying to set up this idea of, like... Emerald becoming a good guy and she'll end up joining the heroes. If he had been talking to Emerald consistently throughout the entire volume and really establishing, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> wait, that statue scene had been happening during that entire tangent? Yes. <laughs> it's really long. <laughs> Um, yeah, if Oscar had been establishing a relationship, like, befriending her consistently throughout Volume 8, I think it would have been much stronger of a plot point. Um, but oh well. Yeah, I think Hazel is kind of like an unnecessary, uh, middleman between the Emerald good guy and Oscar making, like, getting free and befriending the baddies and whatever. <laughs> Like, if they just cut out Hazel and had it be just Emerald and Oscar, I think I would have been stronger. This, okay, when people talk about Volume 6, this is hands down the weakest. This episode in general is the weakest. This whole plot point of Oscar running away just to, like, get a new outfit is dumb. (laughs) That's, why didn't we see him going through his development? And then this plot point of, of Crow being pissy is dumb. Like, I know we're doing a thing with his drinking, but she doesn't even talk about his drinking here. Like, like, Ruby just screams at him because, oh, kids rules, adults drool, and, and then, and then later he's like, I'll stop drinking. And I wish she would have addressed the drinking, because his over-drinking is clearly a problem in this volume. Like, it's a personal, like, conflict the character is going through, but they never address it. They never talk about it. They never actually say, Crow, you're drinking too much and you're hurting yourself and us in the, uh, by doing so. They instead just do this weird thing where it's like, we're cool and kids and adults are dumb and bad. And, and, and it's just dumb. We were setting up this idea of him drinking too much. It's a fine idea. It's a very fine plot point. And instead, they don't address it. Why not address it? (laughs) Just have the characters talk about the thing you are setting up. (laughs) 
It also doesn't help that Lindsay is still delivering real terrible lines here. Starting in volume seven, I feel like Lindsay's performance gets a lot better. But here, especially during this little monologue Ruby has, it's still so high pitched and ear grating. And it's just, it, it also doesn't help that the thing, the, the R way thing they're, they're advocating for is let's steal an, an airship, a, a military grade airship. And, and it's like, it's a goofy, dumb, bad idea that's coming out of nowhere. There was no justification. And they're doing this whole like dunk on crow thing because cool kids are cool and adults are bad. And I just, I just like everything around it is goofy. Like, as a plot point, it should have been so much stronger. If they actually addressed Crow's drinking, if they actually established why any other option wasn't available other than stealing an airship, you know, just there's a lot to it that could have been better. Which is a shame. <laughs> Um, and then, thank you again, JK Network. <laughs> You're too nice. You're too dang nice. <laughs> You're, you've won today. You're winning. <laughs> um, you think it's hypocritical of the fandom to hate and villainize pre-Volume 8 Ironwood, but sympathize with Neo and Emerald. Hold on. I read your words, but I didn't, I was listening to the ad. Let me try that again. You think it's hypocritical of the fandom to hate and villainize pre-Volume 8 Ironwood, but sympathize with Neo and Emerald, especially Neo since she was more gleeful evil, but she's cute so they pass on her. I don't know if it's hypocritical. I think the thing is with, with Ironwood, I think a lot of people just like aren't pay, like aren't, aren't trying to understand the difference of perspective. I think the thing with Emerald and Neo, uh, Emerald, I think it's fine that people empathize with her. I get it. She sh she has shown remorse from very early in the show. Like volume two, she was f at like the first sign of showing remorse for her actions. Um, I think the characters forgive her a little too easily. Like I think about like. Like, like, Zuko joining Team Avatar, they all bring up some pretty good points about the things he's done that are bad. And I feel like they could have specifically brought up specific things Emerald had done that makes them not like her. But instead, they kind of, just like with this, like, like with many plot points of Ruby, they don't actually address any of it. They just, like, they don't like her, but they don't say why. And then suddenly they do like her, but they don't say why. So... Um, fan-wise, I think Emerald is understandable. She has been established to be, especially during this volume, we've consistently seen her, like, not being happy with where she is. She's clearly, like, like, freaked out by Salem. She was clearly only here for Cinder and now being wrapped up in all of the Salem stuff. She's not jazzed about. <laughs> Neo, I think, is a bit different because she... She actually doesn't do a whole lot. <laughs> like, she seems like a killer. She seems like she'd be, like, easy. Like, it would be fine for her to kill somebody. Um, Pre-Volume 8, I understand because, like, she's got a cool design. I get it. I get it. Like, I don't blame anyone for, like, like sympathizing with Neo. Because she also vanishes for most of it. <laughs> like, she's she's teamed up with Torchwick, and then Torchwick dies, and then eventually she comes back. It's after Volume 9, Neo, where she, like, kills Little in cold blood. That's when... Like, she seemed very redeemable before that point. Like, I could see, like, the path of redemption could be a, a thing for her. But then Volume 9 happened, and she, like killed the Jabberwalker, and then tortured Ruby. <laughs> and at that point, that's when I was like, okay, yeah, redemption's gone for you. So it's just weird. <laughs> They're all a little bit different. I think it's like the moment you do a thing that is unredeemable and you don't show any remorse, because that's another thing. Neo doesn't seem to like feel bad about tormenting Ruby to the point of convincing her to try to commit suicide. She just seems to appreciate them to helping kill the cat because she didn't like being possessed by it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
Thank you again, Mr. Corns. You're cool. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so yeah, everyone, they're all doing fish traps. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate Sean. <laughs> it's such a it's such a love hate relationship with Sean when he's trying to be. It's just like it's it's not even it's not even like a consistent like half the time his jokes land the other half the time I hate his jokes half the time he's too dramatic I don't know whatever <laughs> I can't complain more about Sean still. <laughs> Yeah, this is also, this is really, like, we've talked about it, uh, like, at, in detail, <laughs> in excruciating detail, on our Tuesday Team Jacked streams over on Celtic Phoenix's channel. But this is really the beginning of, like, really hammering home the idea of, like, teasing Blake and Yang. And it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> Like, like, it just suddenly starts happening. And that's, like, I think that's the, the lesson of the day, is Rooster Teeth has too many plot points where the characters don't actually talk about it. They don't fully address everything involved with the plot point. They just kind of skip over things and try going into the, into the, like, the next part of the story, you know? And I, it's the same with Blake and Yang. They were arguing, but they're not gonna talk about it, and now they're gonna be all cool, hunky-dory with each other. You know? <laughs> and, like, yeah, so many plot points in Ruby. Especially this volume, I'm realizing, has been up that problem. Okay, okay. Hyper nitpick. So dumb. Big dumb dumb nitpick. But it infuriates me. I hate the, like, touchy-your-ear, like, walkie-talkie bullshit. I think it is so goofy, dumb, and lazy. <laughs> One, they're obviously just mimicking Marvel because they're big Marvel fanboys and that's what the Marvel characters do. They touch their ears and they talk and they hear each other. I think that's goofy. My biggest thing is I'm fine with them having, but how did they get this technology? Did Terra give it to them? I guess, Saffron or Terra. It's, uh, being able to communicate across long distances is an interesting conundrum for characters to solve. And the fact that they just do it because now they out of nowhere have little ear walkie talkies, <laughs> like how the Marvel characters have is such a, like, out-of-nowhere way of doing it. Because they have cell phones. They could just be talking on their cell phones. Or, like, get a Bluetooth. Like, they have cell phones. You could just establish, like, a Bluetooth scenario as well. But the thing is, like, they do their little ear-touching, talky-walky-talky thing, but they don't actually animate it. <laughs> like, you can very clearly see with their models, that there's nothing in their ears. So it's... it's <laughs> so I'm fine if it's like you got like a touchy ear walkie-talkie doodad, but animate it. Put it on your mo like your characters. It's so silly. <laughs> it's such a nitpick. I, I know it's a big nitpick, but it's also because like it just comes out of nowhere with this episode. Like it was never implied that this was technology available to anyone in this universe, but now suddenly, 10 episodes into its sixth season, now our characters suddenly have Avengers style ear walkie talkies. <laughs> Okay, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much again, JK Network. Uh, also, on your Adam and Ironwood point, I agree. I think another difference is Adam was established as a villain and doesn't change. Correct. And I think you said it... W I think... I... Sorry. And I, like you, said it's gray because there are still bad sinners like Valentino. Ironwood changed. Yes. So that's the thing with Hasbun Hotel. There are bad people in hell, but, like, Charlie's main point is anyone can be redeemed. Like, not everyone can, but there are people who might want to redeem themselves, who might want to... who might regret their actions, who could do better. Uh, with Ironwood... His big thing was was never like, like he doesn't. Ironwood's 
plan. Oh, is stream lagging? Is stream lagging again? <laughs> Ironwood's plan, uh, alternatively, is is not related to a specific kind of person. Like, he wasn't trying to save Atlas and only Atlas, you know? It's, um, he wanted to shuttle as many people onto Atlas from Mantle that he could. And the thing is, he's using Atlas because it's already floating. That was his his problem. A lot of people try to paint Ironwood as like, oh, he's he's prioritizing the rich elites of Atlas, cause blah 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 blah. But actually, like, if Mantle was the one that was already floating, then he would do that. What he was doing was he was picking the easiest, fastest option, but that just happened to be Atlas, cause it's already in the sky, you know, um. Just get everyone onto Atlas as fast as you can, or as many people as you can get onto Atlas, you know? That was that was his thing. Where with Adam, with Hasbun Hotel, he, uh, he's not- he's, he's going with all of hell, and he's not stopping to, like, like, judge people. So, like, neither one are stopping to judge specific people, but their executions are completely different. Because, like, Ironwood is trying to save everyone, regardless of who they are. Adam from Husband Hotel is trying to kill everyone, regardless of who they are. So I guess that is a pretty big distinction of, like, Ironwood's trying to help. Adam is only trying to hurt. Does that make sense? <laughs> I hope I worded that properly. 30-second <laughs> lag? Not not too bad. How's the storm? Still windy. It looks like it's coming back in. <laughs> it like went away for a while there. So that's fine. We're towards the end of the episode. We could honestly, you know what, real talk, we could probably skip the last episode. <laughs> the last episode of volume six is so boring, right? It's just like... Nothing happens. It's so, like, a weird final fallout. I always forget it's there. Like, when I think about all the Grimm that they fight, I always forget about the big Godzilla Grimm. Cordovan's, Gar like, because they beat Cordovan's mech, and they, it feels like, because they beat Adam and Cordovan. And then, again, uh-oh. <laughs> I'll just pause it for a second. <laughs> Yeah, like, they, they establish that they they have to, they beat Adam and Cordo, but then, like, oh, Ruby's doing her silver eyes thing, and we gotta do a thing from that, like, like we gotta, like, like have a, a conclusion to that arc, because we're, we have our silver-eyed warrior, Maria, she's here, and, and she's gonna teach Ruby about the silver eyes and whatever, and whatever, and all that stuff, um... So, like, they have to have a big grim for her to fight at the end, and it just feels kind of stapled on. Like, they do a good enough job establishing that the uh, the grim are coming. Like, in the second to last episode, they established that the grim are on their way, thanks to Cordo's mech being, like, activating and scaring everybody. But... <sighs> I don't know, it just feels so weirdly tacked on at the end. It's such a not plot. <laughs> Um, yeah, stream's taking a dive again. I'm gonna actually, now's a great time because I need to get more water because I drank all of mine. <laughs> so we'll have a quick break right now while we're breaking. Hopefully stream can like figure itself out and the wind will stop being crazy. But yeah, we might end up calling stream early. We'll see because the lag seems to be going a bit crazy right now. So we're going to go on a bit of a break. I'll be back to let you know if it's like the break, like it, if it's going to do anything. But for now, let's just break for a second. How about that? Grab water, go to the bathroom, get a snack, do what you need to. We'll be right back. <laughs> But uh, we, we'll see if we're going to keep going with stream. Because all that's left is the Adam fight and then the, the conclusion. We got to the important parts, which was the apathy. And also the statue scene. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's, let's break for a second and we'll be right back.
Hey, I'm back. <laughs> um, I was I, I I realized something. I was thinking about it. Uh, do you think perhaps the problem my stream is lagging so much today, especially, is because I haven't updated OBS in like seven months? <laughs> maybe, just maybe, I'm the problem. <laughs> Hi, it's me. I'm the problem, it's me. <laughs> Perhaps that's what's gone wrong. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> that seems like we're doing okay right now. So let's see if we can fi I'll just skip the, the end of that episode. It's just Cordovan's there. And then, oh no, Adam's coming to attack. Bleh. So we'll get to the end of the Adam stuff, at least. Actually, does anything happen in this episode? The Lady in the Shoe? Does anything important happen here? <laughs> yeah, updating software might be it. Just maybe. Perhaps. <laughs> the critter pulling and it's not you, it's me. It's always me. I'm always the problem. Like, I'm always like, I know I'm doing something wrong. I just need to figure out what it is. <laughs> yeah, the cashew thing. I, I feel like that's such an also, because they do this whole thing to establish that Maria and Cordo hate each other. But the cashew thing, I feel like is a kind of dumb way of doing it. And I know the dumbness of it is like part of the joke. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> At least it's Tide ads. It could be worse. It could be Gillette ads. We've learned that, like, Gillette is the worst ads. <laughs> oh, yeah, Adam's scar gets revealed, and then they do nothing with it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know, that's so, why did Weiss never learn about this? Why, why? <laughs> why? They did like a whole, like, like and, the, and, and, the, and we don't even know how he got a scar. Apparently he got it in like, like the mines or whatever, which they only mention in like his card description for Amity Arena. It's just so weird, <laughs> so goofy. So silly. <laughs> Why have characters with things if your other characters aren't going to acknowledge these things? What's wrong with the Gillette ads? That's when we first started lagging. Also, they're very long and very boring. <laughs> yeah, did he get branded? I don't know. I don't- I don't know. <laughs> like, like, it looks like a brand, but why? I don't know, it's not in the show, so it doesn't matter. Oh yeah, they do a lot of their fight with Cordo in this one. But they don't beat Cordo. They have a couple of cool moments. Like, Jean has that thing where he runs up and he, like, saves Nora. That was a kind of cool moment. But they also, like, I remember this episode came out and then they had a behind-the-scenes video specifically talking about, like, um... Uh, like, consistency in, in where characters are during fights and things. And it's silly, because at the end of this one, Cordo's right up inside of, like, Ruby's butt. Like, right there, ready to blat her away, because she's hanging off the cliffside. And then in the next episode, Cordo's mech is, like, a million billion miles away. And I'm like, you just had a whole behind-the-scenes thing talking about how... This was, like, 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 like all the, the consistency of characters between the shots, and then you immediately... Whatever. <laughs> um... I think, yeah. I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna skip this episode. It's a- okay, I'm, I'm just- whatever. We're gonna skip this episode, and we're also gonna not watch our way. I like Indomitable, but I will cry. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. And I think the majority of the episode is not worth watching. Cause it's like, how long is it? It's a 23 minute long video, and I know like a big chunk of that is like the end credits. Or whatever. <laughs> Hi, Eric. You're back. <laughs> a big chunk of it is the end credits. But, like, it's also a lot of, like, nothing. A lot of standing around doing nothing. 
and the storm's really coming in. And I'm honestly not sure how much longer I can stream for. So we're gonna skip this episode and we're not gonna watch the last episode. We're just gonna watch Seeing Red because that's the important one because nothing happens to this one anyway. Like he does his quick spat with Yang, but it doesn't go anywhere. Um, it's not the real fight. And if you want to see me talk about uh, the fight between Adam, Blake, and y Adam, Adam, Blake, and Yang in its entirety, watch the uh, stream I did last year for the Trevor Project. We raised a lot of money and it was great. And I broke down the entire fight frame by frame. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of a fight. It's a lot to go over. <laughs> Yeah, it's like 15 minutes of actual plot. You're right. It's also a lot of, uh, It's also them, like, like, uh, OMG, the Alasian fleet, the armies in the sky. And I'm like, is this bad? Is this a bad thing? I don't... <laughs> yeah, this is the Gillette ads. And it's like, they're too long and boring. They just take forever. <laughs> Yeah, stream's almost over this time. Well, I'm- honestly, I'm excited for March to be over so I can be done with these Ruby streams so I can stop marathoning multi-hour long streams every time. Every time? Woof. <laughs> every single time? <laughs> like, like having a couple of streams here or there that are, like, longer than three hours is fine. But having it be every stream? Ooh, tiring. <laughs> I got lots of stuff to do. I can't sit around and watch every- have every stream be five hour long adventures. <laughs> Once we finish up Ruby, I'm gonna keep doing streams and stuff. In fact, I'll be asking on my Discord. I have a Discord. You wanna be on my Discord and hang out with my cool Discord- Discord stuff? Uh, you need to be a two dollar patron at least. And then you can join the Discord automatically. Uh, Yahoo! <laughs> um, but I'll be asking my Discord what they want me to do. I know for sure I want to watch Has Been Ho- No. Hell of a Boss. I know for sure I'm gonna watch Hell of a Boss. And when we do that, I think I'll even get rid of my, like, my, like, screen. Maybe not for he Hell of a Boss, because I know, um, it's kind of a lot. <laughs> like this. My, like, subscribe screen. And maybe we can just watch it together. And I can, like, pause more and we can talk about it. Um, maybe not with Hell of a Boss, because I've seen the first episode. I've seen parts of the first episode, and I might need the screen. But we'll see. <laughs> but also, I want to watch something else. So I'll be asking on my Discord. Goodbye, Skywalker. Have, have a good night. <laughs> Uh, so I'll be asking on my Discord what you guys want me to pick between some of the things. I'm gonna start with the things that I've done worth watchings for. I'm like, I'm torn between uh, Arcane, um, uh, High Guardian Spice, uh, Owl House, or the Dragon Prince. So we'll go through all of them eventually. But I'll help you guys. Uh, you guys can help me decide which one of those four I should start with. Uh, so yeah, if you want to talk and convince me of which ones to go with, get a Discord. and Because I'll be asking my Discord. Meta Runner? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I've never, nothing about Meta Runner has ever intrigued me. I'm so sorry. People talk about it a lot, but nothing about it. <laughs> my Little Pony Season 2? I've seen it already. I've watched My Little Pony. i watched up till Season 6? One of them? <laughs> yeah, with High Guardian Spice, because I liked the first three episodes, and then everyone was, like, real, like, not happy about that. <laughs> like, 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 a lot of people were like, no, it's bad. And I'm like, I don't know, these first three episodes seemed pretty good. <laughs> so it can't be that bad, right? But I don't know. I haven't seen the rest of it. Uh, so we'll, I want to see, I guess eventually we could check it out. I don't think it's that bad. I think it's just kind of simple, you know? <laughs> like, it's like, not horrible. <laughs> So, we'll see. We'll figure it out. But wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be a wacky, <laughs> like, stream schedule? Half the time doing Hell of a Boss, and then the other half the time doing uh, something like High Guardian Spice. <laughs> so yeah, lots of fun options. Um, we'll, 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 we'll see where we go from here. But first, we gotta finish Ruby. Oh. 
Oh, it's getting colder. <laughs> oh, it's getting colder and the wind's getting stronger. We gotta finish this episode. Let's go. <laughs> Adam feels like he's coded as a young man while Blake is a teen. Wouldn't she have been a minor when they were together? Yes. Canonically, yes. That is what happened. Because <laughs> he's 20. Um, like, in volume one, he was 20 and she was 17. So, yes. <laughs> yes, that exactly. <laughs> 100%. That's the thing. It was a bad relationship. People, like, like it was, it's supposed to be bad on purpose. <laughs> what about Slayers? Oh, it's an old Magical Girl anime. Yeah, I wanted to maybe watch something Magical Girl specific for when we get to May. I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I'm not gonna tell you where I live, <laughs> Azure Moon. <laughs> I live in the uh, pumpkin patch. Because I'm the pumpkin patch witch. So I live in the pumpkin patch. And that's all you need to know. <laughs> Thank you. What is your name? Hold on. Let me... I want to make sure I get your whole name. And I know your comment's gonna go by too fast. One second. Crying on the toilet? Your name's crying on the toilet? I hope things get better for you. <laughs> what a name. What an, what an unforgettable name. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh, dope stream for my favorite volume. Now I'm gonna head out and get drunk at work. It's a bar. I'm allowed to do that. Have fun. Drink responsibly. Try to stay hydrated. Um... I'm glad I could- I- I- I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad volume six is your favorite. Have fun, drink responsibly, stay safe out there, especially. <laughs> and thank you Godzilla Slayer! Maybe Dragon Ball? I've seen- <laughs> I've seen Dragon Ball. <laughs> that's- that's the problem. I've- I've- I've seen Dragon Ball. I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate you a lot, but I have seen it already. I'm trying to pick things I haven't seen. I've seen- a good chunk of episodes from Owl House, like, the first season. Like, I think I made it to episode 9 or something. Um, but I never got to finish it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, the only other one, like, I never watched more of Arcane. I tried to watch the fourth episode, but I ended up falling asleep. Um, so it wasn't Arcane's fault. It was very late at night. I shouldn't have been watching it. It was my fault. <laughs> Thank you again, Ranger. And Blake was 12 when Sienna became leader of the White Fang. Was she? Okay, so that's like a thing with Rooster Teeth. I believe you. I'm not doubting you. I, I, I doubt Rooster Teeth because I think they forget their own timelines. <laughs> I think they say things and they forget how old their characters actually are. You know? Oh, X-Men 97? I might just end up watching it on my own. You know? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Monica, what's a Monica Magica? It's an amazing uh, magical girl show and you should watch it right now. Make sure you get to episode three. You have to get to episode three. That's def that's one of the ones where you have to get to episode three uh, before you decide whether or not you want to keep watching. I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Rooster Teeth constantly forgets the ages of their own characters and they'll say things and they'll forget that they had shown something somewhere that kind of contradicts or makes that kind of plot point concerning. Because, like, when we see Sienna becoming the leader of the White Fang, Ilya's there, you know, standing next... And, like, we could, could like, like theoretically think Adam is, like, I don't know, 16, 17 in that moment. His design is near exactly the same as his Volume 1 outfit, so it's hard to tell his age. But we could theorize that he was 17 or something. But then Ilya is standing right there next to him, for no reason, and Ilya looks exactly the same. So Ilya also now has, like, perhaps too many years on Blake to make it dubiously underage when she had a crush on her. Which wasn't a problem, because everyone assumed Ilya was the same age as Blake, but now it's like, oh, but, but Blake was 12 in this moment, and Ilya's obviously not 12. <laughs> So it's like, I don't know. <laughs> I 
the Adam character short more or less shows that 12-year-old Blake and 17-year-old Blake had no changes between them. Was she 12 there? Because she doesn't look 12. She doesn't look any different. And I'm I'm not going to lie, Rooster Teeth doesn't do a good job showing age with these characters. Like, Ruby's supposed to be 14, but she's always looked the same as everyone else, right? You know, like, Oscar is supposed to be 14 or whatever, and he looks the same as everyone. So it's it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell, but it's hard. <laughs> I don't know. Because Blake doesn't look, sound, or any different. She looks the same. She sounds the same. She might as well be the same. I, 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 don't, I don't know why they would claim she was 12 in that instance. I don't know why they would say that. It adds nothing. Either than they wanted to like imply Sienna had been leader longer. But that also is, is weird. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. They do that a lot. <laughs> it was like when... Which one was it? Oh yeah, like Yang being like, I raised Ruby after Summer left. And it's like, you were four. <laughs> you were four years old. You weren't raising Ruby. <laughs> also, if Ruby was that young, she shouldn't remember what Summer looks like. She shouldn't have these big old memories about her mommy, you know, when Salem mentions Summer Rose's name. Because if she was, like, two years old when Summer left, she shouldn't even remember what her mom was as a concept, you know? <laughs> oh, thank you. Juan. Juan. It is Juan. Whoa! It's- yeah! Have you seen the Justice League X Ruby movies? I have. I thought about writing a review for them. Hold on. <laughs> Stream's lagging for a second. So before I answer your question, I'm gonna wait for it to, like, get back up. Before I answer your question. Gonna wait for Stream to, like, catch up with me real quick. <laughs> and now I'll answer your question. I have. <laughs> I was planning on writing a review for them. I want to write a review that talks about both movies together. Um... Prob like, just a lot of stuff happened. <laughs> like, Rooster Teeth shut down, and also I had other projects in the works. I'll get to it. It'll be a very big review, but I'm already working on another very big review. I will get to it sooner or later. You know. I will get to it. <laughs> I have seen them. Didn't love them. They were... Not amazing. <laughs> the second one was better. I will say that. It was definitely a lot better. <laughs> Just this dialogue is so try hard, you know? Like, it's so close. It's trying, you know? It's just, it's just missed opportunity. It's too late. You know, this is the only time Adam's ever done anything and we're trying to do this whole thing. In fact, without the Adam character short at the beginning of this volume, there'd be even, like, like that was, like, the most Adam screen time. The most Adam actual development we had gotten before this. And this is his death scene, you know? They just dropped the ball with Adam so much. He's just not a character. <laughs> he is not, he's a concept art at best. And so, yeah, I totally agree with JK. That it's just, he's overrated. He's goofy. <laughs> he doesn't do anything. He's not related to the plot proper. He just distracts from the plot proper. And, and he had the potential of being cool, but that's not the story they ended up telling. They didn't tell a story about the girl and her abusive crazy ex who's in, like, a terrorist organization. They decided to tell a story about real magic and maidens and relics, and Adam ended up falling to the wayside because of it, which is a shame. And also, they should have been introduced- Like, when they tease him at the end of Volume 2, he should have been a bigger element throughout Volume 3, but he's not. He's gone for 90% of it, shows up for his one moment to cut off Yang's arm, and then he disappears throughout the entirety of Volume 4. Except for a nightmare sequence. And then he shows up in volume 5 to like evil snark and monologue at Haven. But that's it. It's 
<laughs> it, it just missed. Missed potential. Missed opportunities. Dang it, I think I've, I I goofed up my headphones even more. I remember last time I said I broke them. I actually had it. I had just forgotten I turned down the volume a lot. Uh, but I keep fiddling with it, so I'm gonna... Uh, I've kind of ruined them. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> you remember Adam was supposed to die in volume three and you could tell? You can tell. Like you, they were gonna have Adam die instead and maybe Torchwick would live, but then they're like, oh, let's keep one of them around, I guess. And they had Torchwick go because I guess. <laughs> the moon slice does look ugly in this engine. A lot of things that used to look cool look ugly. Yang's hair is lame. I think it's, I think it's fine in this instance. Her like flame hair thing is fine in this instance. But every time after this moment, I think the flame effect is more ugly than anything else. And I miss just the regular glow that her hair used to have. You know, it's just, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, Moon Slice looks really bad. Uh, the Maya engine—they just didn't capture that style with the Maya engine. Like a lot of the stuff that Ruby had as a style just doesn't just doesn't work here with how they changed the style, which is a shame. <laughs> yeah, the Schnee does company branding him. Like there's a. If you want to, oh, we have to make Jacques a villain. How are we going to do that? Have him rig an election, I guess. And I'm like, I don't know. We could just talk about him, like, like scarring people's faces or his company doing that. I, I like, <laughs> thank you again, JK Network. You've been so kind. You've been too, too dang kind. I appreciate you so much. You, I appreciate you. <laughs> thank you. Thoughts on Ruby's format of having two main villains, a volume, minus one. Is that true? Hold on. Torchwick and Neo, and then Cinder and Adam, and then Tyrion and the Nukalavi, then Cinder and Adam, then Adam and Cordovan, and then Watts and Cinder, and then Ironwood Cinder, then the Cat and Neo. I had never realized that. I had never... This had never dawned on me. <laughs> I guess it makes sense, conceptually. Because then, because there's so many characters, having at least two bad guys for them to face makes sense. I had never thought of this. I Because, yeah, Volume 1, they fight just Torchwick. And then with Volume 2, it's Torchwick and Neo. Then Volume 3, it's Cinder and Adam. And then Volume 4, it's Tyrion and the Nakalavi. Volume 5, it's Cinder and Adam. Volume 6, it's Adam and Cordo. Volume 7, it's Watts and Cinder. And then Volume 8, it's Ironwood and Cinder. And 9, it's the Cat and Neo. I've never realized. I had never thought of this. <laughs> I guess it is cool. I do like that, actually. I think now that you've pointed this out to me, that's awesome. I had never realized. <laughs> I do like it. I think it works. I think it also helps with, like, because, like, um, like with... Tor like, Tyrion and the Nakalavi, they have like a midpoint villain that they can fight, like having them both be at the end. Sometimes it, I think it works really well. Like I was saying, like Cordo is like, ha offers a bit of brevity in the middle of the more serious dramatic moments, like with Adam. And then having C the cat and Neo fusing together with volume nine makes a lot of sense. I think that's cool. I think that, that that's really cool. I had never realized before. <laughs> I never realized before and I'm blown away. <laughs> I like that a lot. I think it's awesome. Thanks for pointing it out to me because I had never, never thought of it. <laughs> um, it is, you know what? I agree with you, Dahlia. It is ugly <laughs> for being like, like the Godzilla Grimm. It's kind of ugly. Uh, thank you, Sora. Volume one is Torchwick and Cardin. Ah, uh, I guess we can make that argument that it's Cardin. Yeah, volume one's weird because you can tell they're like like the growing pains. It's like it, like a lot of the things in volume one didn't stick around to how they committed to doing volumes two, three onward. Wow, that's fun. I think that's awesome. I think that's really cool. <laughs> um, all right. Do we want to watch the last episode? Okay, we'll watch the last episode. We might as well. <laughs> we'll skip parts of it, though. We'll, we'll skip the beginning. <laughs> the beginning's kind of bad. We'll get right to the fun part. How about that? 
Okay, just for you. Just for you all. <laughs> so if Blake has cat traits, why doesn't a villain just distract her with a laser pointer? I think that'd be funny. And like, especially in volume one, I think if they played around with the Faunus traits more, especially in like light, like that sounds like a Ruby Chibi skit, right? Oh well. <laughs> Yeah, the fact that Weiss never meets Adam is disappointing. He also never meets Ruby, either. Like, half of the main characters have never engaged with Adam in any regard. And that's such a shame. It's disappointing. <laughs> like, what's the point of having characters if they don't do anything? Like, 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 when I realized that Watts died and no one knew him. No one knew who he was. They never engaged with him at any point. <laughs> They said his name once when talking about how much they didn't like Ironwood. They were like, you just said it to trick Watts. Why? Also, Hazel died. Did anyone, does anyone know that he's dead? Did anyone care? <laughs> no one in Team Ruby realized. Oh, I guess Yang was there. But yeah, like, uh, what does it matter? <laughs> so many of the villains, they just, they just kill themselves. The, the heroes might as well not be there. <laughs> Critter, are there beautiful men in Ruby who aren't teens? Yes. 100%. Um. Uh. Ublek is a pretty good. He's a pretty good best boy. I'll admit, Torchwick was rather pretty. He he was around when he was around. He had a cool design. Uh. I know there's others. Let me just think. Let me just, like, go through the Rolodex in my mind. <laughs> um. Depending on your preferences, I can see if you were, like, into Hazel. Or Watts and Tyrion. Of the three, I get Tyrion the most. Like, he's fun. I think he's fun. <laughs> Let's see. There are others. Like, there's a lot of the teachers, you know? I guess I, I would see if you're into Ty. I'm not. He's just so dumpy. He's just so frumpy. I guess there's Ironwood. Ironwood's pretty good. A lot of the Aesops. Is Marrow a teen? I don't think so. I think he's like 20-something, you know? Um, Clover. Clover's real real dang pretty. Crow, Crow and Clover, they're both really dang pretty. Yeah, lots of them. In fact, I think the teens are like the, the most boring. <laughs> Alright, let's see. Should we just jump over the part where the ad would be playing? Yeah. Where are we? And then they do, they're like, oh, uh, don't engage. That is a silly plot point, isn't it? <laughs> when, like, Team Ruby are, like, flying in and all of the military is, like, disengage. And the guy's voice is so, like, quivery, wavering, like, oh, I'm so dramatic. And it's like, you're the military. What do you mean disengage? You're just gonna let the Grim go on a rampage? Yeah, Ty. Ty is Yang and Dad's uh, Yang's and Ruby's dad. <laughs> Ty Yang. <laughs> and I'm like, I just you're the guys who are here who are specifically have the material to kill the Grim. Why would you be ordering your troops to disengage from it? Like just hit it a bunch of times. Eventually, <laughs> how bad is the Jean Bully arc? LMAO. It's infamously hated. It's bad. It's so. And, like, I'm not even, like, opposed to it. Like, bully shenanigans, I think, is fine. I think the problem is, one, the animation takes such a nosedive in that moment. Like, it's, it's a very noticeably ugly couple of episodes. Like, uglier than normal. Like, I am I can be, like, forgiving for volume one, especially having kind of subpar moments here and there. But a lot of the, the bully arc is ugly as hell. <laughs> Two, no one talks to him. No one, like, ta like helps Jean. They all see that he's being bullied and Velvet, and they don't do anything to, like, stand up to help her or, 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 like, help Jean, even though they see he's being bullied by this guy. No one does anything. No one does anything to help him. They all just quietly let him suffer because, I don't know, he didn't ask for help. So they can't do anything about it. <laughs> 
And then three, I, I think Cardin was had missed opportunities. I wish he would have snuck around to like be a consistent like mini threat for them during the school setting. But I think because the Jean arc was so poorly received, they cut out Team Cardinal as like a concept. And I think it makes them even more pointless and boring because Cardin's boring. And then his three toadies behind him are just carbon copies of him, just in different colors. So, it's just, it's an ugly, bad, boring, missed opportunity. And it would have been better if they just talked to each other. You know, just have the characters talk to each other, right? <laughs> so yeah, it's silly that that guy's like, disengage from the Grimm. You're the military with the giant, like, military stuff going on. But don't fight or save the day. So, uh, what we're gonna do, we're gonna skip the beginning, because the beginning's boring. Um... And we're going to go straight to Ruby on her B so we can see the indomitable part and uh, and all that stuff. And and then and then we'll be and then we'll be done. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah, the fact that they never did anything with Velvet. It's so like when you first watch, you're like, OK. And then like you're thinking about it and you're like, yeah, they just sat there and let her get hate crime, huh? Like all of them. They sat there and went. He's such a bad person, isn't he? But then they didn't do anything. <laughs> and you're right. Yeah, Nora, exactly, 100%. Like, Nora could just, she offers to break his legs. And they just don't do anything. Because Jean's like, no, nah, don't, don't bother. Whatever. <laughs> All right. Um, does Indomitable make you all cry? Because it makes me cry. I'm going to try to not focus on the song because I will definitely cry if I do. <laughs> I've tried just listening to it, like like going through the soundtracks and just listening to it. Uh, and I can't because I, I just cry every time. <laughs> it's just too sad. <laughs> I like this gimmick. Oh, now she has a thing she can throw away. <laughs> Just throw that probably expensive piece of technology away. Also, why was Yang babbling in her ear? Whatever. I like having her memories be done in this style. I think that's very cute. And also fixes the problem of them not being the same art style as each other. So there's like better consistency between them all. Because having like the shots of like the current volumes in the Maya engine versus the the poser engine could be visually weird because of how different they end up looking hi dragon palsy hi first time catching one of your live streams can you please lend me your strength as i start my fifth watch through of ruby tonight your fifth you're starting it good luck and we were just talking about how bad the jean bully arc was too <laughs> i believe in you you got this <laughs> um yeah, I think it's a cool idea. And I also, I really think, like, using Jin to freeze time. I like how they continually play with that concept. That summoning the genies freezes time for them. So she says that. I won't allow you to use me without a question again. But then Oscar totally does in Volume 8 to, like, show Hazel and uh, Emerald that Jin is there. <laughs> Hot take, you don't think Nora's funny. I do kind of agree, Sora. <laughs> I think there are moments where she's very funny. I think she's actually her least funny in volumes one through three because she's just trying so hard. She's just, it's just like, it's a lot of like scream, like like early YouTube lol te random kind of humor. And it just, not it's never been much for me. I don't really, I'm not into it. But I think she's gotten funnier over time. Um, not all of her jokes. Like, a lot of them are pretty bad. Like her, get it, crow and raven, they're birds. Not a funny joke. But I do think she is consistently the funniest of the heroes. Um, thank you again, George. Speaking of Team Cardinal, I'm impressed with how much Evermorrow did for the team. I especially liked Dove and Lark. I agree. I saw a tweet. I, I, it, it was, um, uh, Dove is the nice one because doves are signs of peace. And I thought that was very cute. I think that's a lot of fun. <laughs> Evermorrow, I like, I, like, I, I do something 
very, very different was was Team Cardinal in my AU, and I'm excited to see how people react to it. But I like how Evermorrow like actually decided to like make them characters. I think that's fun, and I like how they all have like different ways they bounce off of Team Ruby's personalities. I think that's neat. I like that a lot. <laughs> Missed, like, like Cardinal has such missed opportunities, and, like, it's so easy to play around with them, you know? <laughs> yeah, Summer Rose's boob window outfit, and it's just the outfit Ruby's currently wearing, but in black. It's so lazy. <laughs> like, for being the big reveal of Summer Rose, it's so, like, her current design that she actually has, like, from Volume 9, is way better. But it's like, it's such a shame that like their first ever time seeing Summer Rose and they, they went with this weird lazy option. <laughs> yeah, and she doesn't even one shot the Grim. Cordo has to fly in and save the day. And like, I understand like we don't want to establish that her silver eyes are that powerful yet and we had to give Cordo like her redemption or whatever. Um... But it's, I don't know. It's just it, it, this whole episode is so like like extra non stuff. <laughs> like like it feels so weirdly tacked on to the end of the volume. It's fine, but it just doesn't feel like the conclusion. And then he's and then he's like, I'm not gonna drink anymore, even though we never addressed it. Um, I'm excited for next time. Tomorrow we're gonna do volume seven. I'm mostly excited because Jason Liebricht will voice Crow, and his voice for Crow is way better, and I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, Volume 7. We're streaming again tomorrow with Volume 7. I hope you're excited. I'm excited. Volume 7's great. I really like Volume 7. It, it gets a little ruined by Volume 8, but I'm gonna try my hardest to not just rant about Volume 8 tomorrow. I'm gonna try to focus on, on Volume 7 as it is. <laughs> We're almost done. We're almost done with our, our marathon watch along. You know? What time tomorrow? Same as today. Uh, um, yeah, same time as today. It just, just, they're all the same. They've all started at the same time. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. Yeah, we're all, and we're almost done. It's gonna be exciting. Hopefully the weather is better tomorrow so we can have a more consistent stream without so much lag. I'm also going to um, uh, update OBS because <laughs> that'll probably help, right? <laughs> Not looking forward to the Robin scenes? Oh, I know. God, Robin. Oh, oh, missed opportunities all around with her. That, uh, whatever. I'm, okay, I'll, I'll focus on Robin when we get to her. Just, but... but yeah, we're wrapping up Volume 6 now. <laughs> Did you all like Volume 6? Did you have fun? <laughs> you miss Vic Mignogna's crow? I'm not gonna- I'm not here to yuck your yums or anything. I think he always half-assed it. I think it was a very boring, half-assed, personality list performance. But if you like it, that's fine. You do you. I just personally vastly prefer Jason's performance. <laughs> I think he has a lot more like emotion and energy in it. And yeah, you're right, Pretty Weird Duck. It is the Clo Cl Clover and Crow ship. Hell yeah, they're so cute. They are so adorable. That's my one volume where where my ship exists. <laughs> it is Christina V for voicing Robin, and she's so much better than that. Uh, at least she got to voice a character who, like, sticks around. It's not like getting Kaiji Tang to voice Ren's dad for one episode. <laughs> so we did it. It's that's volume six. It's overs. Okay. Yeah, and then they're like, oh no, the military's in the sky. And it's like, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. Whatever. Oh yeah, and then Salem, like, summons... Uh, winged monkeys at the end. <laughs> and that's it. We did it. We've done it. We did it. Did y'all have fun? I had fun. I think it was a pretty good stream. Uh, nice chill vibes. It was everything I wanted it to be. Woohoo. <laughs> it's nice when they're good volumes, you know? Because, like, I don't... Because when it's a bad volume... I'll like look at the screen and be reminded of something that annoys me. But when it's a good volume, I can just 
hang out and have a good time. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you everyone for showing up. I appreciate you. Thanks for sticking around for the whole three hours. This was a shorter one. We did skip two episodes, I guess. So, and a half of the last... We did skip two and a half episodes, I guess. But also, uh, it's shorter than volume five was anyway. And also, I think each episode was just consistently shorter. Where volume five had, like, a lot of, like, 20-minute long episodes, I think volume six has more, like, like 13-minute long episodes, you know? So, that's great. Ho hooray! <laughs> Wahoo! <laughs> so, thanks everyone for showing up. Was this the last good volume? I like volume seven, but a lot of people don't. I think volume seven's good, but also volume eight kind of ruins volume seven. Volume seven will be the last good one, I say. There are lots of things in volume seven I like a lot. Volume eight is when it really starts going downhill, and then volume nine's just kind of there. It's so hard to judge volume nine like it's just kind of there you know nice emoji combo pretty weird duck <laughs> yeah we get watts versus ironwood oh, volume seven has so many good moments in it I, like volume seven is good i am gonna say there's just the thing is it's just a lot of it gets ruined because of what happens with volume eight but we'll we'll, we'll try to just stay in the realm of volume seven so that's gonna be tomorrow and it'll be same time as today so I'm excited. I hope you all are excited and are ready to have some good fun times together. And then next Sunday, it'll be volume uh, eight. So that'll be great. And then, and then next, next Monday, it'll be volume nine. And supposedly there's a new end credits thing at the end of volume nine. We'll see. Not sure. We'll see. Uh, like I said, I have a Discord now. If you're a $2 plus patron, you can get in that Discord and I'll be there. <laughs> Popping in every couple of hours because I forget that it exists. <laughs> Thanks for showing up again. And everyone who donated with the Super Chats, you're amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you so, so, so much. You're very nice and kind and I appreciate you so much. <laughs> so dang much. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's, it's the end of, of volume six. Thanks for showing up for the stream. Uh, we'll, we'll tackle volume seven tomorrow and I hope you'll have fun with it. So yeah, yeah. All right. We'll all see you next time. I appreciate you. Bye bye.